these counterfeit 20s were the Secret Service called them very low quality. And he gets pulled over by Bethany, Oklahoma police. So this dumbass bonded himself out with counterfeit money. He just bonded out on a minor charge and got himself a major charge. The next day, the Secret Service leaves a card on on at his house. And it says, you need to contact me immediately and bring your friend Kyle. I guess they knew that I was with them. <laughs> We all got together and we didn't know what to do. And I got the idea for, I don't know why, but I said, let's go down to Six Flags. They'll never know what counterfeit money is. You give them a 20 for a $2 item, you get $18 back. Right. right. We started noticing security following us around. We got in line for a, a roller coaster called the Shockwave. I got this new tattoo I'm proud of. You know the Shocker? Y'all don't know what the Shocker is? Where's where's Jake now? Jake's doing good. <laughs> Jaking it up, catching a case. He had a federal, state, local task force for him for drugs, okay? So so what happened? What did he end up getting? Got murdered in the second degree. He got 25 years. You so, started this off saying he was doing fine. Hey, this is Matt Cox, and I am here with Kyle, and we are going to be talking about his true crime story, and <laughs> all right, check out the video. I can't believe I'm here. I've seen you on TV, seen you on the commercials. What am I doing here? How did I get here, man? <laughs> I mean, you drove your motorcycle across how many states? Four or five, yeah. It was a you nice ride. So, you don't look so bad. You came in, you said, I have raccoon eyes or something you, you 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 look all right now it thank you fine. matt um when you first took your glasses off i was like oh wow he when i got to the hotel last night i was like there's no freaking way i can do this man so here i am it's fine um so okay well so i mean we talked on the phone a few times you know we just talked before here so what let i mean let's let's start at the Cause your story really, it's, it's, it's not like you, it's not like a drug, like just like a drug story. Like it spans all the, all these different things have happened that you've been on the peripheral of, you know what I mean? Right. And then sometimes in the middle of, but, but have managed to not be t gotten tied up in them. But, um, so let's start at the, you know, at the kind of the, I was going to say the crux of the problem, but at the beginning, which is, you know, so, you know, like. Where were you born? And I and you know what does your dad do? And what does your uncle do? Okay, okay. Life story here. Yeah, yeah. I was born Thank under a bad moon in Zanesville, Ohio, in 1969. What's up? Uh, two two parent home, very stable. One older brother, very conservative, very middle class, very Protestant, um, well provided for. No, my mom is from. Panhandle of Texas, a small town girl, very the nicest, the gentlest, easiest to like person I've met. Right. She's always been there for me. My dad comes from Dallas and he was a provider, a great provider, you know, classic old school dad took care of us. My dad was really strict. I mean, he, he wore the pants in the family. My dad, um, Got a scholarship, played major college football, was a Marine, and then became an FBI agent. Uh, and what did he, what did he focus on? Sports. Oh, in the F in the bureau. <laughs> in the FBI. Yeah. Well, my dad was a man that revealed very little about himself and even less about his job. But when we were in Ohio, where I was born, he was is just a re resident agency. So. I think they just covered everything. Whatever came in the door, right. Could be I, bank robbery, could be drugs, could be. I know that he used to. Um, it's not like he was on a task force. No. Okay. He used to um, He used to be out of town for two or three days investigating the theft of, inter of cars that crossed the state lines. But other than that, I don't know. I, a funny story my mom told me about was there was a uh, drive-in movie, and they were showing a movie called Flesh Gordon. <laughs> And there was an X-rated version, and then right. there was kind of like a softcore version. So Dad had to go check out the movie to make sure they were playing the softcore version, and he took my mom on this undercover stakeout. <laughs> 
But uh, growing up, sports were a big deal. My brother was playing little league sports, high school sports. My brother played college baseball. I mean, I stuck with basketball through high school. Um, but watching sports was a big deal. That's when my dad kind of was didn't seem so frustrated and mad. And, you know, we were big fans of the Dallas Cowboys of, uh, I don't know. Uh, Did you get into trouble when you were a kid or? First time I got in trouble, I was five years old, Matt. Um, there was a kid that that my mom agreed to watch. It was her friend who played tennis with her. And uh, I didn't know the kid. I was five. I was a little bitty shit. You know, you're right. five. But in my my house, there's a lot of rules. It was real strict. You follow my dad's rules. He, and, you know, it was kind of like the guest was always right. But this kid had just lost his father. And his mom was out on a date. And that's why he was with us. So I don't think he was in a good place. So when we were at church. How old was he? He was like six or seven. He was a year or two older than me. But, um, and I was a real gullible, naive kid. You know, I, I think if this kid would have been my friend, I wouldn't have agreed to do what he wanted to do. But he, he hatched a plan while we were in church that we were going to walk to his house. And that was a long way away. And I was like, okay. And uh, we got our on the big wheels. Remember the little big wheel things? Did you have one? Yeah. <laughs> Those were awesome. Um, we rode our big wheels up to the end of the cul-de-sac ditched him and we were going to walk to his house maybe an hour away and there was a our neighbors had a barbed wire fence that that was the shortcut there was these two big german shepherds that kind of guarded the opening of this fence and i was i was scared of dogs you know we didn't have dogs in our family so we get to these dogs i'm scared and the kid walks through and he's like come on they're not going to hurt you you don't get through so well, i walked through them we walk to his house and uh, he looks in the window and uh, then he says, okay, let's go. And I'm like, what the, f you know, why did we do all this just so he could look in his window? So I was like, I'm not walking through back through the dogs. We're going to go the long way. So the long way was like two or three hours and we were going a long time. So when we were walking through this, this um, farmer's field, there was a barn and he pushed me in the barn and he told me that the old widow farmer lady likes to shoot trespassers with a so uh, with a shotgun loaded with salt and he pushed me in this barn and i remember all the things up to that point but after that i don't remember anything but we had been going for hours my mom and dad were freaking out my brother and all the neighborhood kids were um looking for us and when i got home my dad kind of snatched me by the arm and took me up to the room and he was spanking me, bam, bam, you know, and he wanted me to cry, to submit. And my mom said, I wouldn't do it. You know, I felt like, hey, this ain't on me. That wasn't my friend. I was just being a guest. I was looking out for him. But my mom started to cry. So she started, so I started to cry or whatever. But ever since then, I felt like I couldn't come to my dad. Like I had to hide stuff from him, you know? Right. And after that, kind of a pattern established of taking risk. So, like, when our neighbors had this shed, and I climbed up on the top of it, and I was throwing tools off of it, I got too far from the edge, and I took a header, landed on my wrist. My wrist was hurt real bad, and I had to hide it from my dad, you know. And another time, I rolled our skateboard down this steep-ass hill and crashed at the bottom, had to hide it. Another time, I... um was climbing this tree i was way high and i was holding onto a branch like this and the branch broke and i was falling two two you know hitting branches I, right. I latched on to one and i caught myself but um i just I, I've, I've read about younger siblings taking risks but it seemed like subconsciously i was finding trouble and then hiding you know right this makes me sound like some sort of psycho serial killer, but it's not that bad. But I think every single one of us, when we look back at our life, has little patterns and little tells that that I, I don't know. But right, um, my brother always obedient, straight, you know, good at sports. He knew he was supposed to be a Republican when he was eight years old, kind of like Michael J. Fox, you yeah. know. And I remember. 
like with sports, he he remembered every you know where did this guy go to college, and he knew he he's like a sports genius. Stats. Still, still to this day, he sports is his. You know, he follows his college football team around. He loves sports. That's my brother's way of kind of party. You know, but um, I remember my brother used to like talk about communists. Remember when the communists were the 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 Cold War, and we were supposed to fear the communists and. I'd tell my brother hate on the communist and my dad would be all proud of him and stuff. And I would be like, man, he doesn't know anything about this stuff. You know, he's just doing what dad wants him to. So I would say something like if our government tells us that their government lies to them, couldn't our government be lying to us? And they would call me a communist. You know, if you can see that dynamic, right? The good, bad, you know, Positive reinforcement was not was a rare commodity in our house, and my brother kind of cornered the market on that. So you so know, you like to poke the bear. Yes, sir. Um, my friends later on, I'm going to tell you about. I think similar. You know, right. But uh, the only other thing about being from Ohio that kind of added to this story is my whole family is from Texas, and the older brother kind of rub it in that you're a Yankee, you know, we're all from Texas, you know, kind of thing. Just kind of, right. that's kind of ways, um, kind of the way it was. Um, I hope you can high try. school. Do you, do you get in trouble in high school or yeah, in high school? I always got great grades cause I had to get good grades. Um, I mean, we started getting in trouble very young. Uh, we, when we moved to Ohio, I felt, depression i mean i didn't know i felt just like my whole world was dying after we moved from my, my dad got transferred from zanesville ohio to oklahoma city he's from texas and the bureau makes the agents move every 10 years i think probably so they can't get corrupted or something i don't know but uh -huh. you know it's like you put in where your preferred residence is and dallas is where my dad's from so we got closer to dallas so oklahoma is Indian territory, if you remember that from your history channel. Right. And I think that place is a little cursed from all that. But when I moved there, I was immediately getting into trouble. It was just guys on my little age. How old were you? Eight. Jesus Christ. All right, go ahead. Um, <laughs> I have a story, but I can't tell the story. But... um. My, one of the friends I met, my first friends, and this guy is going to be a key player in this story. Um, his name was Jake, and we played on the same Little League ba basketball team. And right. Same Little League football, ba basketball, baseball. My dad would coach one team. His dad would coach the other. I mean, we were close. And so we, I spent the night at his house, and um, his mom and dad said, good night, boys. Have a nice night. And about 30 minutes later, his older brother, Corby, eases the bedroom window up. And I'm like, what's up? And we snuck out into the forbidden night, you know, and it felt kind of good. Yeah, we, I mean, I don't know what we did. We, I think we ran around and rang doorbells and ran. I think we broke into a car and stole some Coke, some, some, grocery, some grocery bags that were left in a car. But from the get-go... I mean, these guys were crazy. They didn't like get where they weren't scared of getting in trouble. Like I wouldn't do this if I was at my house because my dad would have my ass, right? But um, through the years, we used to sneak out all the time when I hung out with Jake. Jake was was kind of the opposite. He was a confident, charismatic kid, you know, alpha. He, you know, when you're around Jake, you felt like you were – you were the show. You weren't watching the show. You were the shit, you know? Um, um, like Jake, when we were in elementary school, he would be like the, the school fight promoter and he would get start a fight, but then he would arrange a decoy fight on the other side of the schoolyard. So the real fight could last longer. Um, and he, they were always talking about, sex girls you know i didn't even know what that was but 
I mean, when, when we were like in the fifth grades or he was in the sixth grade and he had a fifth grade girlfriend, he wanted to have sex with this girl. So he devised a plan to got and he got her friends using peer pressure. He got with them and said, man, I know you girls are all virgins, but I want to get, get with this girl and talk like you're not to get her to have sex with him, which she didn't fall for. But Jake was real manipulated. Right. <laughs> um, so the first time, first time I ever smoked pot, I was offered drugs was the sixth grade. And this kid down the street, it wasn't Jake. He's like, hey, you want to try something? And I was like, okay. And he, he went into his dad's um, bathroom, pulled out a little baggie of this green fluffy substance, and and we rolled up a joint. And I mean, it sucked. It, we couldn't even smoke it, but it seemed like anytime anyone offered me anything, I was like, okay, you know? And right. there was this feeling at home based on the relationship with my dad that things weren't right. You know, it never felt right at home. It felt more, I felt more like when we snuck out at night, like the night accepted you, you could be who you were. You didn't have to have this mask, you know? And it seemed like that was a pattern with people, you know, the people that were a little dark, I guess you would say. Right. I would feel more comfortable around. I mean, I think that's common when people look back at their life. But um, uh, the first time I ever smoked pot, for real, I, I, I met with Jake. Jake was a year lo younger than me. So we had this house in our neighborhood. It was called the Round House. It was kind of an anomaly. It it had a Spanish tile and right. it was a round house like Adobe and all the other houses weren't like that. It was just old ranch houses, suburban ranch houses. But um, I met Jake at the Round House. That was our meeting spot halfway between our houses. And he's, we're headed to baseball practice and he's acting kind of funny kind of goofy and his eyes are kind of red and i'm like what's wrong with you dude and he's like man me and my older brother corby and these kids that moved into the neighborhood um these two brothers we smoke pot i'm high and i'm like no you're not you know i didn't believe him so we got to baseball practice and um we're warming up you know you throw playing catch right the coach is right there and jake fakes like a a high fly to me i look up and he drills me right in the gut you know, with the ball and I'm like, Oh, and, and he's on the ground laughing. So I believe, you know, he was, I believed him there. Right. So the next day, um, we all met in the ditch and the ditch is like, you know, the canals and subdivisions they yeah. build, the, you know, that was our clubhouse and it was connected with these miles of tunnels mm -hmm. and those tunnels were, you know, the first cigarettes, the first game of truth or dare with girls, you know, first, a lot at first but i sat with four guys smoking weed for the first time my friend jay his bro older brother corby their our new friend danny and his little brother david we're all sitting in a ditch underground on the tunnels you know and they're telling me come on i can't figure out how to inhale it and they're like come on dumbass come on pussy you know right. you, i finally figured out how to do it and we walked out and i was like wow this is great this is great um but the fates of those four guys are going to lead to this story you know okay. it's kind of like the classic thing story you hear about drugs and and um and you know what happens to the results of drug drugs right. and stuff and um but uh so through high school that you know i i played sports i got good grades i walked the line i hung out with my buddy and he was doing wild stuff even back then but i was the one that would always say no Who, I'm not, jake this is jake, jake? Oh. yeah jake was just wild you know and uh <clears throat> around the eighth grade he told me he was going to um steal a car and him and another guy waited outside of a daycare in our neighborhood and they jumped in a car when the person went in to go pick up their kids they drove to um mexico <laughs> went from to a, oklahoma from oklahoma eighth grade how far away is mexico from oklahoma one state yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's Probably about 15 hours yeah. but there's there's you a, weren't with them no oh, no okay. i see i didn't do that kind of stuff but um 
what he told me is they went to a town called Boys Town right across the border in Laredo, and it's kind of a famous kind of sex tourism town where truckers go across, and you know, there's bordellos, and right, they partaked, <laughs> they got laid. And How old was he? About 14. Um, it's not gonna end good for Jake, I can already tell. <laughs> You know what? He's doing really good now. Now. And out of respect, his family treated me like family, you right. know? And there was some, when we first met, he told me that him and his, his, his mom and dad didn't love each other and they're going to get divorced when they're 18. And I, you know, I didn't know, you know, what, how to process that, but right. I think that, that, you know, knowing that, they weren't on firm ground. I think Jake and his brother Inten lost respect. You know, they're yeah, yeah. That impending doom of that their whole family would break up at the age of eighteen kind of did, didn't give him a firm foundation to. It seemed like things were kind of a lie, you know. And his family treated me like my family, so I think he had a similar situation where one parent was really accepting and the other parent was strict and could turn off love and you know and and i'm not going to really say which one out of respect to the family but um um i think that has effect on the self-image the same way i didn't really feel like i belonged in my home that outsider that's misfit and i know there's a lot of people especially at this age that can probably relate to that to some degree but um uh did he get in trouble when he came back I mean, if he's gone, if it's a 15 hour drive, he would call his parents and they would, they, they rescued him. They get a bus, right. bus ticket. But when we were younger, they got into a lot of trouble and, and they, um, they, they always had jobs and, you know, they did their chores around and, you know, it, it's, it's not what you think, you know, right. things weren't all right in the lily white suburbs, you know, from the outside in, it looks, looks good. But I mean, I think we can all say that as well but um uh around jake's older brother corby started hanging out with that danny kid a lot danny was do you remember the movie the outsiders yeah danny was a greaser he was a character from the outsiders they they came from the rougher part of town right. and he was real standoffish you know he seemed like he was ready to fight like he had a chip on his shoulder all the time but um i heard that his father worked for a bookie a famous bookie the biggest bookie in oklahoma city a guy by the name of Pody poe but um that's a whole another story and he comes up later on in this life i met him in prison but um while visiting my friend in prison i didn't do any time but um danny and corby were hanging out in Corby was act, acting crazy. Um, you know, he's just having all kinds of problems at home. One time I spent the night with Jake and Corby came home late and he got into a cussing match with his parents. Like, you know, F you, y'all don't love me. You know, he, well, it turns out that him and Cor Danny were smoking freebasing. You know, they were into cocaine. Right. And um, this would have been, I was probably 14 and but I wasn't doing cocaine, right, right. but he was probably about sixteen. The one thing about Corey was he was he wasn't in the sports like we were, but he was in the drama department. And I saw him in junior high. He performed the lead in a play, and he crushed it. He was singing, and you know he was an actor, and he continued on with that through high school. And he had colleges looking at him for giving him a scholarship for the drama department, but um. It was the summer before my sophomore year in high school. And it would have been for Corby the summer before his senior year in high school. There was a newspaper article about a man had been found shot in this multi-level tree house, probably five miles from our house on the north side of Oklahoma City. And I'd heard about this tree house. It was um, some like BMXers and skaters had, bore, had, had built it. I'd never been there, but... A guy got shot there. They found him with 
a bullet wound to the head and it was a big case and it the tr- it was called the treehouse murder in the late in, in the headlines and um they didn't know who did it for a couple of days so it kind of came out who who done it but i remember my dad coming to me and asking me if i knew anything about this <laughs> And it, it was canvassing the neighborhood. Well, it was from the newspapers <laughs> because it was uh, my best friend's older brother was the suspect, you know, and bam. So this is Jake's older, older bro- brother is the suspect. Okay. And um, it turns out there was a, a guy, his name was Thornton. I'm going to say his real name because he's passed out of respect to his family. I'm not going to say his last name, but he was 25 year old guy. Hanging out with high school kids. That's odd. Right. Drugs. Right. You know, the, the paper said allegedly he was selling marijuana to the kids. I'm sure that they were doing other things as well. But also it says allegedly that he was making sexual advances on these boys. And one night, one of Danny and Corby's friends got kicked out of this guy's apartment. And Corby and Danny had been freebasing cocaine all day and drinking. So they went over there to kind of avenge their friend being kicked out. And I'm sure there was other reasons behind it. You know, it's, it was a scene I wasn't involved with. But they lured, they lured him to this treehouse probably to get high or give him money or something. And and Corby shot him. <laughs> and uh, so how did they find out that Corby shot him? You're saying they didn't know for a few days, but how did I think he turned himself in? And I think they had a pretty good idea about it, you know, from, from back travel, but yeah, he turned himself in. Um, um, the crazy thing about that is I remember one night me and Jake had snuck out and we went over to Danny's house and this was before this happened. Hopefully you can edit it, (laughs) but, um, um, and it's the first time I see Danny kind of let his guard down and he was, you know, we got high or something. And we remember that song, eight six seven five three zero yeah, yeah. nine. And we were air guitar and that, and it was cool. We had fun, but then I was like, hey, you know, I gotta go. So Jenny, don't lose this number, right? Um, and um, so they 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 made a big deal about it. You know, I'd walked home millions of times, but they're like, no, we're gonna walk you home. And Danny pulled out this gun, and I'm like, what the fuck? We don't need this, you know. Right. And they, they made a big deal about walking me home, whatever. See you later. Well, that was the same gun that was used in that. Right. The, the murder. But it's devastating, you know. I felt bad for Jake. I felt bad for Corby. I felt bad for his family. You know, it was a big trial. and So there was an actual trial or did he ple- end up pleading guilty? There was a trial. And I haven't mentioned this on this tape. I mentioned it to you. Um, Jake and Corby's father was a high-ranking official with the State Department of Corrections. He was one of the top five guys for the Oklahoma State Department of Corrections. So that was blasted all in the papers. And um, so he's trying to mount some kind of a defense, like, hey, he attacked me, or I was self-defense and I shot him, that sort of thing. Right? I mean, I'm, I'm sure. They tried to. Otherwise, there's no reason to even go to trial. Like, I the clean, trial, clean shot the guy. I read the transcripts and... Um, it was basically i think it was whether or not it was going to be a murder or you know i think they his family hired high priced attorneys got it reduced to premeditated murder right. to a manslaughter he got convicted of manslaughter in the first degree how much, how much time 99 years at 17 years old i mean that's pretty stiff for a manslaughter well i mean i, I think mean, is he in, he's in jail now Oh, okay. So he didn't do 99 years then. So. No, he got out after 16 years. <laughs> Fuck. Um, yeah. Doing really good. What right. I hear, I haven't talked to him, but making well into six figures right. you know, and on, on the right path. I think because of who his father was and it was been blasted, he couldn't go to an Oklahoma prison. He, you know, maximum right. security prison. And I know that, I don't know any of the details are particulars i know that he was out in california and i think washington state and i think it was a pretty easy prison where he got like conjugals and stuff like that but i'm I'm not sure i mean i know he got conjugals because i think he had a family man i really 
I don't want to go it, into it, his it, life. It, anyway, yeah, yeah. So, so I hope y'all can edit no, that part. You got to stop worrying. Don't worry about it. It's fine. I had all just, this. Just, okay. um, so what, so, so anyway. So it was he, he, devastating. Got right. Um, you know, I remember the radio played uh, from the trial and you heard a shriek in the courtroom when they announced the sentence. Right. And I was their, their sister, you know, freaking out. And Jake, you know, I felt like he was a pariah. You know, a lot of his friends, parents told him, don't hang around this guy. You know, he's bad news. And my family always never did that to me you right know, they were they were friends with i mean we, we were all tight and they didn't judge but um it sucked <laughs> i mean it's sad that that happened you know and i think that happened because a guy was really high in sight on in, in a state of psychosis induced by drugs you know and in his trial it says you know he admitted that he doesn't remember anything until he, he hearing a gunshot and looking down, and it was in his hand. So um, crazy. Kids don't do drugs, man. <laughs> so, so I, I mean, so what happened after that? I mean, he is, you know, are you did, you know, are they still in the same? You're still hanging out with him. You're still same. Um, you know, we ran in different groups. Jake's right. Jake's a center of attention guy in junior high. Do you remember a bullshit popularity contest? Yeah, yeah. We called it spirit royalty. He was always voted one of the top three. I didn't really consider him this way, but girls would say he's a super good looking guy, high confidence, you know. By the time high school came around, I think he'd gotten kind of a bad reputation. Uh, But we we would see each other on some, we were friends, but we I didn't hang out in the same groups as him. When 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 me and Jake hung out alone. I felt like we could be ourselves, but it seemed like when we were around groups, that's when he tried to be the badass, you know, and starting fights with people and all that. And that was not my scene at all at that time. So, right. but um, through high school, uh, you know, Jake played football and he was a real good football player. And his sophomore year, he was on the JV team and he he scored like seven of the touchdowns at their team it's you know seven out of the ten touchdowns but he was hanging out with that danny kid and why he would hang out with the same guy that was partially responsible you know right for uh this is why i'm right this is why you look back and you know what happened you know it's it's friends even though i'm not making excuses for anybody or myself but you I mean, you kind of, I'm sure you have done that to some degree, yeah. haven't you? Yeah, I'm sure everybody does. Um, but they were hanging out. Danny and Jake were robbing houses in high school. And in Oklahoma City, the toughest neighborhood that we knew of was the project called Kerr Village. So they would rob houses, go to Kerr Village, and handle their business, you know, trading their stolen goods and buying crack. <laughs> And for suburban kids to go into the toughest neighborhoods, you know, I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a a recipe for disaster. It's also, you know, when you come from a very structured life and everything's, you know, as it should be, there's no real excitement. There's no real rites of passage, proving grounds. I think that's something that that was evident in all that. But um, Jake, Jake was on the path to go to prison. You know, right. And, but he straightened up and he had a, a girlfriend, a good, a good girl that he, that he, you know, they dated and she, I think she influenced him. He ended up dropping out of school because he got kicked off the football team and enrolled in a private school in which he, um, he could work at his own pace. And he finished his junior and senior year in one year, married his high school sweetheart. And they moved away to Baltimore, which was a – he needed to get out of all the influences that, that he had. Um, so, at, after high school, that's where Jake went. For me, even though this story is all about my friend, you know, 
I found out that I was my dad got transferred back to Dallas. So the day I moved graduated high school, we moved to Dallas. And here I am in Dallas. Now I'm gonna switch this story up. Okay. <laughs> uh this is a crazy thing in my life. But when I moved to Dallas, it was just like when I moved to from Ohio to Oklahoma City. I felt like my whole world was dying uh, in a state of depression, you know, which I, sh- I I was moving to a great city with beautiful women, you know, all kinds of opportunity. But I had to feel sorry for myself, you know, and right. I was kind of mad at the world. And, and we were staying with my grandparents and um, my dad's my dad's parents and my they were really strict, you know, they were a lot like my dad. I saw, you know, the kind of people that you couldn't really be yourself around, but they were um, successful. Yeah, I wasn't in a great state of mind, rebellious. Right. And I, I didn't want to move to Dallas. Right. Who? Little violence. Um, we were staying with my grandfather. My grandfather was very religious and um is he catholic no we were protestant very protestant people very and hold catholic. your emotions in really yeah so so catholics i feel are very it's a very kind of a scary religion <laughs> there's all kinds of you know there's all kinds of saints and spirits and this is all kinds of shit going on there's crosses and don't get me started because yeah. you will not get monetized and yeah. it's off it's, off topic know, there's, uh, there's there's the, the seances and there's uh what do you call it um exorcists and you know all this creepy shit comes out of the catholic religion like it's super creepy i mean when i was a child they told me that there's this invisible man that controls all and he knows every thought in my head and he's judging my <laughs> to me that's pretty scary and intrusive but that's a whole nother should mm-hmm. should keep you on the straight and narrow but it apparently it didn't <laughs> so, so you moved so you moved so we moved in, um, we were staying with my grandparents. My grandparents, my paternal grandparents always represented how we were supposed to be, you know? Right. Nice house, country club, brought us to church. Grandma always had swimming lessons and tennis lessons and vacation Bible school. And um, so they represented you know, yeah, some, well, yeah, what, what I thought yeah, at that time was righteous. Yes. Pi- pious life that you're supposed to be living. Right on. And my grandpa, and, and you just mentioned that you're a Catholic, and the difference between Cath- Catholics and Protestants, which I am, is that in Protestants, you decide on your own free will when you get saved, when you accept the Savior, you buy the whole Bible. Right. Jeez. And when I was little, older brother, of course, did it when he was 12. And um, like a lot of people do it. I noticed my older brother all s- sitting with uh, the kids from his his uh, class. And they all got saved at the same time. And I thought to myself, just like the communist thing, I'm like, well, that preacher says that this is you're supposed to be sure, absolutely pure faith. But. Why are they doing it all around the same time? Are, are they actually sure when you're 12 years old? Are they doing it because their friends are doing it or because grandma and grandpa did it and because mom and dad did it? I was that kind of asshole that questioned everything from, from the start. So I never did it because I didn't feel like I would be being honest. I thought eventually I would work myself when I got older, you know? So um, um, my grandpa... You know, at that time, I had long hair, smoking, kind of a little rebel. Grandpa had a talk with me, a come to Jesus talk, literally. Right. And I gave him the same answer I just gave you, very respectful and and honest, you know. And he was quiet because he couldn't say nothing. And the way, it was the way my dad, my grandpa was, is you could tell that they were upset, but they, all their emotions were bottled. Internalized it, yeah that's a big theme in my in our family but um the next day my grandpa freaked out on me and it's something involved he accused me of uh, being about the worst person you can be which i wasn't and it was involved another family member and it was kind of a backhanded accusation and 
and it was stupid. And I knew it was based on our conversation before, but at that time, you know, my dad had told me, um, I mean, my dad had this conversation like, son, you shouldn't be doing this or whatever. And I got mad because I was like, that's what he thought I was doing, you know? And, um, I, I, I told my dad, I can't stay in this house anymore. Yeah. And you know, my dad understood. I mean, the thing my dad, my grandpa accused me of was, I can't even address it. And it didn't happen. You know, it was stupid. And my dad understood that, but, um, I left and, but that's the point in my life where all the things that my friend Jake, you know, had offered to come on, come do this, come get in this kind of trouble. And I always said, no, at this point, I said, F it. I don't care. It was my breaking bad moment, I guess, even though I'd right. never heard that, that right. term. So by the, by the, I'd moved to Dallas and the first friend that I met in Dallas, this is a crazy story. You're going to think you're going to think I'm crazy, but I'm going to tell it just how it happened is I was on my way to work. I seen this little, hot little like, like uh, heavy metal, dope skinny kind of Stevie Nicks type, and I was wearing a Led Zeppelin shirt, and she gives me the devil horns like that, and uh, that was my first friend in Dallas, and she was seventeen. Her name was Sheila, and uh, that day we had lunch, and she's asking me what I'm into, and I was like. You know, I like music, having a good time, sports, whatever. And she's like, no, what are you into? And I'm like, I don't know what you mean. And she says, I'm a witch. And she said, oh, it won't work on you based on my reaction. You know, I, that's a world I never acknowledged, whatever. So anyway, her, she had a boyfriend and they were my first friends in Dallas. And her boyfriend's name was, uh, John. What was he? <laughs> he was just a suburban kid that they were, they were hellions, but right. he never said anything. They were hardcore alcoholics. And, At uh, 17? Yeah. I mean, they were the kids that I didn't hang around. You know, the freaks in school. Right, right. They were more like that. You know, we were more like the jocks. You were eyes on wearing, polo wearing. Uh, yeah. The socias. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Outsiders. Yeah, yeah. I like it. But um, one thing this guy told me, you know, he had these friends and in Dallas, on the north side of Dallas, there's a big old church. It was called the World of Faith. And um, it was a famous televangelist named Robert Tilton. Well, you know, broadcast on TV. I think he got caught up in a scandal. Well, him and his alcoholic friends i mean hardcore alcoholics probably in high school they decided to rob a grape and they broke into this church and perched a skull up in a urinal <laughs> wow I, the, I, I, these it's are all bad. It's all bad so um so you know J john i think is the name i called him um he had just gotten out of jail for his like third dwi and they were just my friends. They this accepted me. this is the me. kid that's like, said they're what, 17, 18 years old? Yeah, he was a year or two older. But the the girl, Sheila, was a runaway from Tulsa. And I got to know her, but I got to be more friends with John because, that you know, they I'm not going to be best friends with the guy's girlfriend. Yeah, yeah. But um, one night, one day, they're sitting around, and, you know, we drank a little bit and dropped some acid maybe. But they're like, you want to do some speed? And I'm like, okay, like I always do. Right. They busted out needles. And I'm like, no, nah, I'm good, you know? They're like, no, nah, no, this is the best way to do it. You know, I'm like, okay. And so I I'd snorted Coke once in high school, but next thing you know, I'm shooting up meth, you know? Right. And I hear all the addiction shows on YouTube talk about, horrible addiction people get on opiates and heroin and stuff like that but i mean shooting up meth i did it on the weekends and i went to work oh well, i didn't become a junkie like right. that but um that went on for about a year but a crazy story and i wasn't high when this happened wasn't drunk but john used to like 
for me to come pick him up and hang out with his boys. He would leave Sheila at home, and Sheila didn't like that. She would freak out. She'd be screaming and yelling and all kinds of stuff. But one particular night, I go pick him up, and she's real calm sitting in the corner of the room. And the mood's kind of like um, when a storm hits, you know, that morose, just kind of quiet, but you feel something in the air. Right. She looks at John as we're leaving and says, I won't be responsible for what happens to you if you leave me alone tonight. And we're like, okay, you know, she, she's, she's tripping out. Put a hex on him or. Okay. So we go over to his friend's house and his friend has a Japanese fighting sword. And John grabs it, and picks it up, says, check this out, dude. And he, it's in a cover. He thinks the cover only opens like this, but it really opens like that. And he sliced his fingers bad, like blood's everywhere. So I'm freaking out. You know, I take him to his mom's house. His mom takes him to the ER. I call him a couple of days later and he's like, come check this shit out, dude. So I go over to his house and he's got a cast from here to here. And they had like rubber bands connected to the cast and they had drilled holes in his fingernails with strings tied to the rubber bands because they had to reattach all his tendons. Oh. So that, that, that held it in place. But the crazy thing about this was the scars on his fingers were three lightning bolt S's. And that was the initials of his girlfriend. <laughs> Do -do -do. It happened. Okay. Gonna say so. I was gonna say what. So what happened when he healed? He was fine. Yeah, he was fine and couldn't play the guitar anymore. No more piano. No. <laughs> I, or yeah, I don't. Maybe he had a superpower. So <laughs> you never know. But an interesting story about this girl is when she moved to uh, Dallas, her first boyfriend was in a band. He had started a band. The name of this band is was called the New Bohemians. Okay. They were playing playing one night at a club in Deep Ellum, which is a section of Dallas where it's cool, it's a party section of Dallas. And a girl joined them on stage on a dare from from their friends. And this girl's name was Edie Brickell. Edie okay. Brickell the New Bohemians. Right. They they popped off with an album. You know, remember the song, I'm not aware of too many things. I know what I know, if you know what I right. mean. And Shove me in the shallow and water. Sheila was was dating the guitar player? The, yeah, Sheila's boyfriend. They all lived in a house in a section of Dallas on Greenville Avenue. It's kind of an artistic section. Well, Edie kicked Sheila out of the house because Edie said she's practicing black magic on people. She just couldn't. Sheila just couldn't couldn't get right now couldn't do the right thing if and that you you have to, i was raised in within the container of reason and reality that stuff did not happen but when you witness stuff like that it makes you recalculate what whatever some scars it's fine uh <laughs> oh i i can tell you all kinds of stories now i get into native american stuff and they acknowledge those worlds as being real. Right. Even your own world you just mentioned has exorcisms, right? I, I, there's all kinds of craziness going on. Do, 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 do. Yeah. Um, anyway, yeah, yeah. It's fine. That is a world beyond real and reason. And a lot of people don't care to have no reason to venture out from there. That's all I can say. But um, on that album... You know, the album that Edie Pacal and New Bohemians came out with shooting rubber bands at the stars. There's a song called Little Miss S. You read the lyrics to it. I'm pretty sure it's about this girl that who what knows? happened to her. Um her and her and Jeff had a you know, she was they they broke up, she went back home. I I really don't know. I hope she's all right. Right. Um that's all I can say. What's up, Sheila? <laughs> Hope I'm not breaking the uh, rules of Fight Club here. So, so what happened? What happened after that? Um, so I, I told you those stories just to tell you the mindset I was in. Right. So my old buddy Jay, 
Moved to Baltimore, got married, trying to get away from all the bad influence. He's on a path to prison. Um, somehow, him and his wife moved back to Oklahoma City. They, you know, they got homesick or whatever. And, of course, being around all the old influences, they didn't last too long. So he got a hold of me. And we, I went up there. I think I, I was in college, in a community college, probably during Christmas break or something. And he was splitting up with his, um, with his wife. And uh, him and Danny had hooked back up. They were up to their old games of breaking into houses. So they talked me into breaking into houses with them. So How old are you at this point? 19, 18. So one weekend, I go out. We drive around all the neighborhoods, rich neighborhoods of north side of Oklahoma City. And just like you see in the, the movies or whatever, you're looking for newspapers and driveways. And we found a few prospects, waited till dark, and we'd drive through the same same houses, the houses we remembered. And and slowly we'd open up the mailbox. And if they had mail in their, in their mailbox, they are going to rob them. And uh, this was way Cause beyond cause my... Because they're assuming that the house is is vacant because they didn't get the mail. Someone's out. Of, yeah, they, they got newspapers in their yard. They're getting mail. They're um, they're they're robbing the house. That's you know, I, I mean, security people used to say, "Don't leave if you're if you're going out of town. Pick up your you newspaper." Have somebody pick up your newspapers. Yeah, yeah. Wouldn't happen now because no nobody one, gets a newspaper. Yeah, we don't read you anymore. Put an AT, a, a, ADT ADT sign in your front yard, and people just. Keep on driving. Right. Oh, I'd rather go to the next house. Right. Um, but so we spent that night breaking in about three houses. I was just driving, you know. Right. And they would be like, okay, let us off in the alley. I was just driving. Part, you're part of the conspiracy. It's like, <laughs> I know. It's like the guy driving the, the getaway car. And I, I, you know, I know these two guys that are robbing banks. How do you know? I'm driving the getaway car. It wasn't my fault, Dad. <laughs> it was my friend's fault, man. So- um, but dude, right. you, you know, they would, they, I would drop them off in the alley and they'd say, come back every 15 minutes, man. And I, you know, I was nervous. It's, this is a world I did not believe. What year in. is this? There's no cell phones or pagers or nothing like that. Right. Or is there? It would have been be in the 1988. 90s, right? Yeah. No. 89. No, you guys. It was don't. pagers. Yeah. But there's no fucking, it's not like you guys had a, a mobile no, no, cell phone. No, no, I get where you're going. Yeah. 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 Oh no. So I was wondering like, what do you mean every 15 minutes? Like. Yeah, and I had to drive back, and I mean, I'm not, I'm not proud of this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, I just did it. And they're very influential about f- from my friends, but um, we robbed about three houses. And right. the funny thing after this happened, and we had VCRs and silver and gold, and they got a bunch of, like pillow ca- cases full of change from this one. I mean, a thousand dollars worth of spare change that a guy had or something. I don't know, but um. Danny and Jake would have this conversation that I'm sure they've had many times before where Jake was like, okay, we're going to take this money and we're going to invest it and we're going to rise up. We're going to quit robbing houses. And Danny we're, was like, we're going to, we're going to go buy heroin. <laughs> That's <laughs> right. Or yeah, like we're going to buy cocaine right, and start we're gonna, selling it. We're going to, this is our, our, our come up. And, wow. uh, and, and, and Dan, he was like, okay, yeah, we're just going to do this one time. We're going to show Kyle a good time, right? And we go into the projects. The toughest neighborhood of Oklahoma City was called Kerr Village, or at least it was to us. And right. drive into the projects. And the thing about that place is there's only one way in and one way out, which kind of adds to the element of danger. But my friend had been doing this since high school, you know, a little 16-year-old kid going in, in these places. And he told me, He's like, you know, these people will have the edge on us because, you know, they're from the projects or whatever. And he said, all you have to do is act crazy. Do something crazy in front of a group and you take the edge back. They're scared of crazy white boys. Is exact, You know, this is the kind of mentality. This guy, <laughs> so, he had nuts, dude. Right. Uh, he had nuts from the time he was young, dude. But um, so we went in there supposedly one time and then that's – that lasted like three or four days of a crack binge. <laughs> and you guys didn't, there was no, you didn't we didn't do our come There's no, no reinvestment. Yeah. It reminded me of playing sports, right? And, you know, coaches talking about 
we're going to take state or whatever. But um, that happened. Nothing, you know, I didn't get busted, thank God. But um, I guess I went back back home to Dallas, and it was summer vacation. Jake had kind of linked up with this other guy. And his name, I called him Aldo in the book. Right. I'd heard about Aldo in high school, like all the girls chirping through the halls about this great looking dude that they all liked. And he was from a different school and he was kind of like a pirate or a conquistador conquering all the suburban girls. You know, I could have named him Fonzie or right. Fabio. Okay. And uh, I'll bet you that Colby doesn't know who either one of those people are. I know Fabio has long hair. It's about <laughs> See, all this stuff is dated. Yeah. yeah. No, no, every, no I understand everything. I I know everything that you're know, everything you're saying, but you know, if, I, I, every time I I think, oh, that that's you know my generation, I immediately think Colby's never seen The Outsiders. He doesn't know what a greaser is. He doesn't know what a soch is. He didn't, like there's all these things that I've. But usually I say something, but I was gonna. Dude, we could educate you. Look <laughs> on stuff that he has no reason to know. <laughs> could care less. But yeah, I got enough. The Outsiders, enough less than zero. That's a great movie. Yeah. Um, God, that's, I can't. Yeah. Um, what's the other movie about the vampires? Um, The Lost, Lost Boys. Boys. Uh, I was a big Jim Morrison fan back in the day. So, um, um, where was I at? So Aldo, Fabio, 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 um, Jake had hooked up with this guy, Aldo. And to give a backstory on him, another made up name, but Aldo was, uh, his mom was Italian American and his father was Latino. So you can imagine this guy, you know, Casanova, Don Juan. But Aldo had spent time in Houston. So I guess Jake and Aldo had combined their superpower, superpowers of juvenile delinquency. And he, Jake started doing what he talked about with Danny. They were going to Houston and scoring um, ecstasy, MDMA. Right. And um, so... They were driving down there one time and they were drinking or something and, and Aldo rolled a car and he got busted and they busted him for a DWI and had, they had traces of cocaine or something like that. So Aldo was sitting in the jail kind of thing. I think he was just sitting out his DUI time and Jake got a hold of me. It was, it was uh, my summer vacation from college. What did I do on my summer vacation? You know? Right. So he's like, dude, I got this new crew and we're going to Houston and it's not what I was doing with Dan. It's fun. You got to come check it out. So I was like, okay, that sounds awesome, man. You know? And uh, so I moved up to back to Oklahoma City and, and me and Jake started going down to Houston and scoring ecstasy pills. And we were living with this, girl you know very attractive girl and there was all the girls in the scene they would come down to oklahoma city and i mean they would come down to houston with us and houston at that time was just crazy you know it was all these clubs um all these suburban kids and that that vibe you know when you're on x you're you everything is relevant and you're cool and and it's just the spirit of love, energy, man. It's cool, but um, to be down there scoring drugs, it's 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 a poor town. So all the suppliers know people come in from out of town. So when word gets out that there's buyers, you know, they would come to your hotel room and offer you, I got this, this, this for this much. You know, it was kind of cool, and it was kind of like underground. And at that time, you know, you're worried about your future and going to college and what you're supposed to be major, but this was major. And then this was different. This was free, you know, it was like F you to all that stuff. So, um, so we started driving to Houston, picking up three, 400 ecstasy pills. And you're bringing them back. What are you doing? Are you selling them yourself or you yes. have somebody else? Okay. We're selling them, buy them for $6 a pill, sell them for 25 bucks a pill. And this is at the time, fashion to set the scene it's remember the kind of the zoot suits uh 
like Jabot and Kazi and Z Cavaricci there. Oh, yeah, Z Cavaricci. That was our crew. We all had Z Cavaricci's with their baggy pants and they were filled up with pills. And we were only 20 years old. We weren't even old enough to get into the club. Right. But bartender would give them a couple. I mean, we were kind of like the draw, you know, right. and you free drinks. It was living that high life. And uh, so that went on and. You know, eventually, I mean, I remember the girl that we were living at, you know, when we moved in there, I was like, man, are you sure it's okay for me to stay with her? You know, and he's like, oh, she don't mind. You know, it was, it was a one bedroom apartment and I, I don't, it, it was too much, you know, and, but I remember that she had told me that her, her mother was dating or friends with the guy that worked for the sheriff. And even back then, you know, girls talk, our business was being told to authorities or whatever. Right. And, um, but, you know, we were driving from between Oklahoma City and Houston like once, twice a week, you know, and then eventually we were living in hotels and it was just crazy. I mean, it's, it's a lot of work doing that, you know? Right. And, um, how long did this go on? Um, it went on, my summer vacation basically but we eventually moved into an apartment and uh it was a real high tone high a nice apartment it had two bedrooms it had a hot tub in the bed in one of the bedrooms and uh it was like less than a mile from the subdivision we grew up in the far northwest side of oklahoma city but um um our, our landlord was this finance guy that been barred for doing some shady deals or something right he sat in the leasing office taking bets he worked for a big bookie all day but we would pay our rent with pills or later eight balls you know it was kind of kind of weird but you know it was club life all that it's kind of like a 16 year old wet dream you know right girls money jake and aldo bought matching Z zx10 ninja you know motorcycles they might as well have said had i am a drug dealer tattooed on their foreheads you know they i remember jake used to western union money to houston to make deals i'm like you can't do that you're leaving a trip you know he's like oh fuck it if they if they don't catch it with me on me they can't you know do so yeah, that's not true. But uh, I hear you saying no, you're like, a kid, right? Yeah, and yeah. Uh, the feds, they can right. do anything. We're all guilty if, right. if the feds want you. I hope they're not coming after me after all this, dude. But um, uh, so Aldo, the, the, the profit ecstasy, we weren't making that much. And um, I had I had taken a couple thousand dollars out of my college fund, you know, and right. I, I gave it to Jake and I told him, dude, I'm not a drug dealer. You know, I, I just want his money back. I was kind of like that idealist. It's like, man, these drugs were meant to teach us, you know, like a hippie. I don't believe in making money off of them, you know, just pay me my money back. He's like, sure, okay, you know. Um, but uh, Aldo had, had met a guy at the club, and this guy was from a famous basketball family in Oklahoma. That's all I can say. I believe that he had coached, either him or his brother had coached a team I played junior high basketball uh, against. And I guess he sold drugs too or something. But Aldo had gotten him to commit to giving us $3,300 for three ounces of cocaine. So we were switching commodities at that point. Well, they could get a quarter key for 43 and 40, a quarter key is eight ounces. And this guy was only wanting three ounces. So for a thousand dollars, they got five ounces of cocaine pretty right. much. So we, we were driving down to Houston. This guy has a mistress, this beautiful blonde lady. She was like a model, like a local swimsuit model or whatever. And they're probably in her 30s. She kind of re resembled um, Melanie Griff Griffin, Griffith. Remember the act, the blonde haired actress? Um, oh, yeah, yeah. But she's beautiful. And uh, we're, we drive down to, to Houston. We pick her up. And as we're driving down, you know, Jake gives her like a couple hits of ecstasy. And we're all 
rolling, you know. And she'd never done it before, and we're having a good old time. And she looks at him, and she's like, I can't believe I'm going down to make a major drug deal with you because you look like you're 16 years old, and your friend back there looks like he's about 14. She points at me. So <laughs> it's, it, that was crazy. But um, we went down to Houston. They scored the Coke, whatever, and it was uh, ether cut, fish scale, what people talk about, the most preferred type right. of cocaine. And um, – we dropped her off at the airport. She had these baggy pants on and she straps it all to her thighs and all that stuff and the way she goes. And from wow. that point, yeah, the ecstasy, no one gets strung out on it, you know. Right. It's It, it, it was okay, but the cocaine's a little bit more serious. But most people are, the stuff they were getting is straight off the brick, pure. Most people cut it. Right. They didn't cut it, you know, we just sold it, but sold it at a very high price. So, um, from that point, it, things got weird, you know, I didn't, I, I didn't want to be there, but I just wanted to get my money back, which they could have paid me at any time, but they right. did. So, um, um, but there was a time we went down to Houston and, um, we used to do a lot of acid. We didn't even do cocaine. It, I, I didn't like it. I didn't like the way it feels. It, right. Like nothing sucks more than if you've ever been in a room full of cokeheads talking. It's, they just talk, 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 and they don't hear you at all, you know. But um, So me and Jake are on our way on a dope run to Houston. Okay. We have just enough money to re-up. Right. You know, a little for traveling. As usual, we drop some acid, tripping balls way down there, and we were going to turn and burn. We were going to make the deal to come around, turn back. I tell him, dude, I got to get some sleep. I can't turn around and drive. If you want me to drive, I, I'm going to get a hotel. And he's like, yeah, cool. And I see a hotel on the north side of Houston, and it's $25 a room. I'm like, nice hotel. It's a bargain. And it was daylight, so <laughs> looks good. And we pull in there, and I remember this this black dude sitting there asking me if I need anything. It should have been a giveaway, and I'm like, no, we're straight, appreciate it, whatever. But So Jake goes to make the deal, and I'm at this hotel, and day turns into night, and I'm hearing gunshots and people doom, doom, banging on doors and screaming, and I'm like, oh, my God. And uh, I start looking out the window, and there's the same car circling the parking lot. And I'm like, man, what's going on here? And he gets back. And I'm like, tell him, we need to get out of here. This place is hot. And he's like, man, you're always the paranoid one. It's cool. You're but, tripping. Right? right. And he takes off the picture from the wall. And we line up the biggest lines of coke you've ever seen. Right. So, so she's probably good in, in that situation. Perfect. Probably. Yeah, it was, a, it was a good move. So... He ends up on the floor looking out the window, seeing the same cars. Right. I'm over the bathroom with this big old bag of coke ready to flush it down for like six hours. Finally, I can't take it. I'm out of cigarettes. So I'm like, dude, I think we're tweaking. I'm going to go get a pack of cigarettes. I'm going to shove this shit down my pants. And if nothing happens, we're getting out of here. Because like, okay. cops will never look in your pants. <laughs> I mean, I, I figured it was, a, it was a suicide mission. Either I'd make it or I wouldn't. Right. Of course, nothing happened. So I pick him up. He's like, get out of here. We're right on the intersection of I-45 and 610, if you're familiar with Houston. So I jump. I, I'm like, man, I need the $5 I left at the, at the the for the key deposit. We need that to get home. And he's like, no, no. So I stop in, and I get my $5 as I'm walking out. There's a car that we'd seen circling, and the guy gets out and points at me. It's like, there they are. And we're like, oh, shit. I jump in the car, and we haul ass. And Who, who were they? What, what? Man, I we don't know. I think they were like managers or like pimps or dealers because this hotel was in the hood. So, you know, it was action goes on. It was a hooker hotel or whatever, right. crack hotel. So, we, I mean, we he was thought, just out of place. Yeah, we didn't look look right but um as we're driving up i-45 we keep seeing these same cars that we thought were circling the hotel and then they'd pass us and then they'd be pulled over on the service road so 
we're like freaking out and I'm asking him if we want to keep going up to Oklahoma and commit a federal crime or get busted in Texas and go to Texas time. And we're right by Huntsville, which is the, the headquarters for the Texas prison system. There's all kinds of prisons right from the highway. And he's got this towel. We got this towel in the car and he puts this big bag of Coke in, in the towel. He chucks it out the window. It's our whole net worth. It's like chunking 10 grand out the window of your car. And as soon as he throws it out, he throws it out at a sign. We quit seeing all the cars and all they all disappear. <laughs> and <laughs> so we call our partner up in Oklahoma. We tell him what what happened. He's like, "You dumbasses, y'all are tweaking out." But um, you know how many t- stories I've heard about guys flushing uh, half a key down a fucking toilet? Or <laughs> like, I mean, left. This is like a a common thing. I heard these guys they they get fucked up and then they get freaked out and they see like the same car twice and in their mind. They're fucking. They're they're coming at the at the room with battering rams. Like in their mind, the cops are pulling up and everything. And really, no, it's just some guy driving drove by twice. It's actually two different cars. You know, <laughs> it's a strange thing. The mind on drugs. You know, don't get high on your own supply. I guess. But um, we we ended up calling our buddy and we sober up by the time we get to Dallas and we pull up to the sign and. Oh, you like found a it? little baby. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> I thought you was gone. No, I was waiting for cops to be, be, be waiting on us or nothing. But, um, I mean, we had a lot of scares like that. Um, you know, and I had little omens like that. A kid, Danny's little brother, David sat down with me one day at our apartment and he urged me, he's like, dude, these dudes are hot. They don't hide what they're doing. The cops know what they're doing. You don't belong here. You need to leave like now, you know. And he sat down for like two hours trying to trying to convince me. He said, just get out of here. You can go stay with my house with my mom if you want, you know. And right. that meant a lot to me because uh, he passed away not too long after that. So so respect to uh, David or whatever. But I didn't listen. But the, the lady that um, went down to it with us, to score the the mistress lady, the diva lady. Right. She uh she they she knew people and she told me to get the heck away from these guys because you know they're on the radar. Cops know what they're doing. Blah blah blah. So um, and we even had a guy that was staying in the apartment tell us that one night a guy in a suit was rolling around the the parking lot writing down license plate numbers and he even came up to our apartment was looking inside so i have no idea what that was all about but anyway um you know it's a lot of work driving to houston once or twice a week and running an organization and doing all that one of the cool things about it is when counting the money when you're you know a part the whole floor is covered in 20s hundreds or whatever one night um, Jake tells me he's going to um wipe his ass with a hundred dollar bill because he always wanted to do that and he did and flushed it down the toilet. <laughs> Stupid. But uh we we met this guy. We, it was the night of the Sp- Sp- Tyson, Mike Tyson Spinks fight in nineteen eighty nine. We got a room, a hundred dollar room at the Marriott or something like that, just to watch the fight on the pay per view. And we're tripping on acid as usual. And Jake tells me this guy's coming over to make a deal. And this guy always bought like two ounces of coke. He's like, this guy's kind of serious. He's a big old boy, all steroided out. You know, he kind of creeps me out a little bit. But so anyway, the guy came over and I met him. And, you know, he was real serious, all about business. And he was intimidating because he's so big. But he turned out to be a really good dude. And uh, I'll call him Steve for the, for the purpose of this show. So... You know, he was buying buying a couple ounces for some people that owned a nightclub or something like that. So after that, we decided to send down a minion to go down because we were tired of doing all the legwork. And the minion claims he got ripped off of all the money. So all that money that we had, gone. Right. You know, we gave up our apartment. We had to move back in with... Uh, with Jake's dad, you know, they his mom and dad had divorced, but um, the guy Steve turned out to be a good guy. He had a body shop, and he was giving us work, trying to just get us back on our feet. And he told us these guys that he knew wanted us to go down to Houston 
and buy half a kilo of cocaine with counterfeit 20s. They had printed up a bunch of counterfeit 20s. And would okay. you do that? I mean, uh, no, I, I, it's, it's just that the counterfeit, the counterfeit money in, 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 you know, like the drug industry or, um, that happens. Like I, I wrote a book about a guy that same thing. He, he, somebody went to buy pills from him or something and he, uh-huh. he bought pills and the guy gave him the money and was trying to get out of the car. He's like, whoa, 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 wait a minute. He was counting the money. He said, I counted the money. And he said, the money was there. He said, but it felt weird. Like he's like, you know, you, he said, you don't realize that you can feel it, you know? And he said, so I counted it. And if you don't, he said, if you don't have the right paper, like it doesn't feel right. Like that's a, obviously the paper is a big thing, but he was counted. He was like, something's wrong. So he turned on the light and he's looking at, it, he's like, but it looks good, but I could feel like something was off on the money. The guy took the guy immediately jumped out of the car and ran. And so he, <laughs> they, he gets out and runs after him and they're like, and the only reason he chased after him is that the guy had a bottle of um oxys with his name on it he's like so i don't give a shit about the the money i don't care about the pills i care that he's got my prescription bottle uh-huh. with my name on it he's like and that that could come back to me he's like he's buying a few he's buying 400 worth of fucking pills he's like so i don't give a shit because he was making enough so much money doing doctor he shopping. just didn't want it all right he's like i just don't want my fucking my bottle out there so that's why he chases him all the way down an alley they get into a fight he's like finally he gets the bottle back and Anyway, um, but same thing that, and then Jeff Turner, same thing. I've I've met guys in prison who would like print it up and they'd mix it in with uh, real money. But yeah, eventually somebody because it, ha- it does happen a lot. People they figure it out. This was straight up. I mean, he he was dealing with Colombians, you know, right. and it, it it's not like the movies. It's a house, right? And it's a family, but they've got people watching now and. These counterfeit twenties were the Secret Service called them very low quality, and right. but the texture of them didn't, didn't feel, feel right. right. Oh, okay, and they say you're supposed to put them in a dryer and put stuff in there to kind of rough them. I yeah, don't yeah. know. There's a movie called To Live and Die in L.A. Of a long time ago. Of course, I told Jeff Turner about that. Great movie. That's White probably the, that is the premier right. Like that is the top counterfeiting movie out there. What's the guy's name who plays a counterfeiter? Guy, you know, real skinny. William Defoe. The fucking great, I love him. Bro. Yeah, yeah, great, he's great. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was a, that's a great movie. That's one of those few movies I've ever watched where at the end of the movie, I didn't see it coming. What's you know, that? it's called To Live and Die in L.A. Great movie. Like, you watch the whole movie, and then the ending, when it comes out, the ending hits, you're just like, I'm not, I'm not going to say it, but, I mean, you're just like, whoa. Whoa. Like, See, I don't, I don't remember the Indian. It's been oh, so it long. So I was shocked. I remember the song. It's a great, oh, it's a great movie, and, and they have a great counterfeiting scene, like the opening, yeah, yeah, scene yeah. of that movie where he's actually making the the counterfeit money is phenomenal. It's um, like he's an artist. Our, I, I find that most stories aren't like the movies where everything is precise and military precision. It's, no. it's no. idiots that fall into things, no. you know, <laughs> that's yeah. our story. We're, I mean, it, I, it's like, it's like, uh, the guy we, we interviewed a guy, uh, a detective who was, did like 20 something years in the, um, uh, auto theft for auto theft, like uh-huh. a detective. And, you know, to me, all the movies I've ever seen on auto theft, going in 60 almost, seconds. yeah, they almost seem like it's sexy. The truth is, it's usually just junkies breaking into breaking into cars and stealing right. them, and you know, and it's haphazard, and they get caught, and they're in and out of jail, and it's just, you know, like there's that's, no like true professionals that have it down pat. To me, that's real life versus the delusion. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, but um, um, so these guys, I wasn't dealing with the guy, but Chase, like no fucking way, dude. I'm not. I mean, I'm, this isn't slipping a few twenties into a lot of real right, money. This is this, all, uh, yeah. He's like, no, I'm not going to do that. And I feel like ripping off Colombians, although I'm sure they're good people. <laughs> it doesn't sound like a good idea. No, it seems like it could go bad. Yeah, I've heard about them cutting your tongue out and yeah. doing other thing, crazy things. But um, right on, right on. So, but the, they gave this in between guy, this guy Steve. Ten thousand dollars for us to kind of they look at. Pa- give him some paper. Yeah, and <laughs> they told him whatever you just. Look, this is for looking, you know, to see if y'all want to do this deal. Don't be spending it. They told him not to even touch it. Of course, 
badass Jay. So he's taking it and taking girls out to movies and spending it. Just exactly what they told him not to do. Right. So at this time, it's getting to be my son. I miss summer, the, the fall classes, because I'm still stuck here. I'm wanting to get my money back. Right. Scared to tell my dad what I'd done. Right. But um, I had crashed my car, so the only transportation we had was his motorcycle, his crotch rocket, so I'm riding around, bitch, on that, and it's getting cold. But um, we're riding on that, and he gets pulled over by Bethany, Oklahoma police, and they arrest him for a ticket, a warrant, a bench warrant. So I'm freaking out because I know he's got all this money on him. And so I get the bike back to Steve's, and Steve's like, oh, shit, you know, and we're about to go to the police station, and we see him, Jake, strolling down the road. Like He's like, they can't hold me down, you know. We're like, what, what happened? <laughs> and he's like, um, well, when you know, when they bust you, they take all your possessions and they've seen all this money. And the jailer dude's like, son, you got enough money to, to bond yourself out. So this dumbass bonded himself out with counterfeit money. <laughs> so, you know, we're not, that's not going to be. Yeah, the that's, end of yeah, that's, that's going to catch up with you real quick. So now you're just waiting for the, so you just bonded, he just bonded out on a minor charge. On a traffic warrant, yeah. And got himself a major charge. The next day, the Secret Service leaves a card on on at his house, and it says, you need to contact me immediately and bring your friend Kyle. I guess they knew that I was with them. <laughs> so this how'd, is, you, how'd you feel when you saw your name? Did the heat shoot up through your body? Like, <laughs> it, oh, my God. Yeah, so, but I knew I hadn't, you know, I hadn't done anything. Jake does what he does I'm best. I'm just driving the car. He just, <laughs> it's, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Jake, I mean, of, of all the stuff we did, I mean, if they we either caught, you got caught with drugs, that's more, that's bigger than counterfeiting by a long shot, right. I think. But anyway, um, Jake's like, okay, he does what he does best. You know, he starts scamming, making up a story. He's like, okay, we, I'm going to say that I was at a bar and a guy came to me and asked me for change. And he's like, you're going to verify that. And I'm like, no, I don't want to do that. They, <laughs> they are not they, lying to an FBI agent. They know. Let's, you know? let's keep adding on to this problem. <laughs> and he asked me for change. I had a, he had a, I had a million dollar bill and, and he, <laughs> And he gave me change using these counterfeit hundreds. The fuck? Who's making change for giving you $10,000 in counterfeit money? What kind of change was he making? For I, what? What bill? I had a $10,000 bill? Like, what am I, a bank? I don't think they would have bought it, huh? I, no, I don't think they would have bought anything. Across the, I don't think if it was making change for a fucking 20, they were going to buy it. So right now, like if you were playing, a, if we were writing a movie script or we were playing a virtually re, virtual reality video game, and me, I had three options, you know? I right. could either, the first option would be probably go home and get away from the scene and not have any issues. Right. Or the second option would be, lie to the secret service for my friend or the third option would be the option that we picked which would we all got together and we didn't know what to do and at one point we were thinking about one of us go to like kansas city and another go to another town and just start spending buying dollar things or whatever i got the idea for i don't know why but i said let's go down to six flags amusement park in dallas we'll they'll, just, they'll never know what counterfeit money is the secret service doesn't give their employees a course on how to pick it up which we found out they did and it's fenced in <laughs> <laughs> i mean and, and they they don't have their own internal security i did i mean you know that show the world's stupidest criminals and right. we watch it and in hindsight you know you can laugh at people but when you get caught up and you're not thinking straight, you know, that's all I can say. Man. Right. Uh, sorry. But um, so we all, not only does the Steve decide to go with us, he gets his business partner, which they own a body shop, this guy named Roger. And Steve's wife decides to come with us. And they have three kids. Yes. And this, 
this this mission that's doomed to fail from the start. I mean, even if we got away with it, they already had these serial numbers, and you know, it was to so, to, to the cops, it had to be be comical. But yeah. uh, so we drive all to drive to Six Flags. This awesome crew of criminals. Which Six Flags? One in Arlington, Texas, okay. Dallas area. So I guess subconsciously I was getting closer to home one way or the other. But um, um, so we get a hotel we get a hotel room that night, and next morning off we go. And I'm the most proactive one there. I mean, we all had two thousand dollars to spend. There's five of us. That's ten grand. But I'm doing it, man. I'm buying shit. You know. So are you supposed to be trying to get change or just spend it i'm buying like a little keychain or a trinket okay so you give them a 20 for a two dollar item you get 18 dollars back right right and i'm doing it man i'm there to do it and there's a you know the basketball hoop game where you shoot to get yeah. stuffed animals well i did that one a couple times because i always played basketball i thought it was pretty good and those games are rigged by the way but um uh, I didn't win the prize, right. and that guy picked picked it up. The counterfeit, yeah. And uh, we started noticing security following us around. And this is another kind of funny thing: is I was wearing my favorite shirt, which kind of explains my attitude and what I was doing there at that time. It was the uh, the it, it was. Sid Vicious, the basis, the late basis for the uh, punk rock band, the Sex Pistols. And on the front, it said, undermine their pompous authority, reject their moral standards, make anarchy and chaos, your trademarks, blah, blah, blah. Okay. And it all had on the big black in the back, it read Sid, S-I-D. So I can imagine the security people. Talking, about, yeah, it's Sid. You know, I'm, I'm like yeah. wearing a jersey, identifying myself. But we got in line for a, a roller coaster called the Shockwave, and you know, you wait in line. It's kind of like, do, do, you know, you kind of forget what's going on. But there was a guy in front of us as we're waiting in line for about an hour, and he's kind of looking at us funny. And we get on and we ride the roller coaster, and we pull up to the little boarding station. And the guy that had been sitting in front of us in line all the time was like undercover Six Flags security. And he's got two local cops and they point us all out and they don't raise the bar and they take us out and frisk us and they're pulling out all this money. And it was crazy. And they handcuff us and take us through the jeering, laughing crowd, you know. And all my friends were, <laughs> were had their heads down, but I was like, Fuck y'all, you know y'all. Are... Did they get every single person? Yep. Even the kids? No, the kids weren't with us at the time. They just had kids, which. Oh, okay. okay. Sorry about that. Yeah. Yeah, I thought you guys were dragging around three little kids. We could have got them to spend the money. But you know? daddy, I don't want to spend the kind of money. <laughs> so, um, I remember we're sitting in Six Flags Security Office, and we're just giving each other. Sh- shit grant you know it's fuck and they took our information and there's a lady cop and i remember i guess whenever you run my ad my license it pops up who my dad was and she's like did you know your dad's an fbi agent like, no. yeah, yeah, yeah. I, mean, I know he used to leave at nine in the morning i don't know where he went. <laughs> but um and i remember that jake had a a bag of weed and it's common now it's you know but we called it hydro it's real expensive weed hydroponic weed. Right. but he had a bag of weed in his pants and he flushed it down the toilet at in the office but finally we knew the guys in suits were coming in in a secret service and they take us and take us to fort worth downtown to the secret service office and it's late at night i'm in this dude's office and it felt exactly like that uncomfortable feeling I had with my dad I was trying to make conversation. I'm asking him about the football game and who won this game, you know, <laughs> and it was stupid, but uh, he sat me down and like, what's up son. And at this time I had no experience dealing with police. So I didn't know you're not supposed to, to, to talk or whatever. So did you tell him, I'll tell you what's up. Jake's fucking got a bunch of money. He's been spending <laughs> all over this place. I don't know. You guys need to talk to him. 
I do. So you better, you better hope they don't talk to that. me. You better hope they talk to you before they talk to me, because you have some fucking problems. <laughs> I'll tell you right now, I'm not going to fucking jail. Well, counterfeit, that's a pretty cool charge. I've only met three people in federal prison who had counterfeiting charges, by the way. And that's, and I met a ton of people. Like it's. I looked up, you know, they told me someone was trying to scare me and they said that the max penalty is 20 years and that I, they had me for seven and they could stack them. Or They're not going to stack them. I, the yeah. average penalty for counterfeiting is 18 months. I, I was just going to say, I, uh, typically you t- typically what these guys will get if they just plead guilty is like you, you're saying 18 months is like probably the average that people do, but it's like three years. Right. Like, I literally knew a guy who'd been caught for counterfeiting three, this. I met him on his third bid huh. and he, he got seven, he got seven years and they caught him with a couple hundred thousand dollars. Cause he knew. Yeah. And he, he used to say, if you're going to get out and commit another crime, make it counterfeiting. He said, it's got the best. It, it, yeah, for for the amount of money you can make in it, the risk just, reward, the risk reward is huge. And this guy been in, he he would get out. He's like, I'll just I just fucking do it. I'll do it for hundreds of thousand dollars. When I get caught, I plead guilty. They drop it down to one k one count. You get one count plus your criminal history. He started off the first time. He got like three years, kind of like probation. Uh huh. Then he got like six years. So you're only doing eighty five percent of that. Then he ended up with. I think eight or nine years. He did get eight or nine years the second time, like the third time he got eight or nine years. But still, he was like, listen, for the amount of fucking money, he was, especially if you know you're going in, if you know they're going to, it's going to catch up with you yeah. and you put away money, he was, it's worth it. And I was like, God, this fucking guy, he's nuts. <laughs> That's 15 years. I mean, I hope he got a lot of stuff with that. There are you know, there, there are certain, and you know, you've, I'm sure you've met these guys. There are some guys that are just, you know, they're just not going to, you know, you call them, you know, can't get right. You know right. What I'm saying? Like, they're just not going to, they're going to be criminals their entire life. They're going to die a criminal. They're, uh, they've accepted it. This is what they want to do with their life. And that's it. Like, you know. It's a self-image thing. It's yeah. all, but I mean, all they, the energy they spend on figuring out how to circumvent the law. They could have. Yeah. But this guy, apparently he had, listen. He had tons of commissary, had plenty of money out there, had like they didn't get him. Like he he knew the whole time he was doing it. I'm good. When I get caught, you know, everything's in my mom's name, my this person's name, that person's like he was setting it up to go to fucking jail okay. the whole time. That's what I was he wondering. Knew. He, yeah, you know, uh, okay. he knew. He okay. knew. And he was like, when I was like, what are you doing when you get out? He said, well, yeah, what am I going to do when I get out? I'm like, fucking, what do you mean? What am I? <laughs> well, you don't want to do. Yeah, wow. Same thing I do. I'm going to do what I do. And I was just like, fuck, are you nuts? He was like in his late thirties too. I was like, you're fucking getting, getting up there. He's like, I'm in my fucking thirties. I'm getting out in a couple of years. He said, I got another bit in me. I was like, Oh my God. He was, he was actually, unfortunately he was actually a pretty, really a cool guy. <sighs> Not because of that. He was just a cool guy, you know, gotcha. it's, very, it's upsetting too, because you know, He's so like, he doesn't need any money on his books or anything. No, no, that's he, that's you know he was just one of those guys. Like if I had thought I was going to get caught and put away money the whole time, but I was just arrogant enough to think they're not going to catch me. I'm too sharp. I'm too smart for him. So I didn't put any money away. So I didn't think about all oh, those. Like this guy was smart, smart enough to know. Oh no, they'll catch you eventually. <laughs> I was like Jesus. Like he was bright. Um, my uncle told me that similar, the be- one of the best crimes risk reward is being a bookie. I mean, I don't know how many bookies you ran across and, oh, and I don't, I don't think I ever, but I wouldn't even know what that charge would be. What would that charge be? I don't know. I don't know. I think it'd, pro- it'd probably be mostly like a state charge or something, right? Or maybe tax evasion or something like that. But, uh, I've, I've heard that having like a, a blackjack table. If you get if they caught you with a blackjack table, that's a federal charge, or I don't know. Uh-huh. But um, uh, so I'm sitting in this guy's office, and he writes out a statement, basically saying, "Yeah, I knowingly and willingly passed and possessed fake bogus U.S. notes, and I signed it." Right. And um, I did i throw my friend under the bus at that towards the end i didn't offer it they they came to me and they said did your buddy know that money that he bought a 
And I was like, yeah. Did he? <laughs> I mean, how, you know. But <laughs> Does a Pope wear a funny hat? But um, um, so then it's like three in the morning and they're taking us to some federal lockup and a sheriff's in Johnson County, Texas. And I never been to jail before. I didn't know what was going on. So when they pull us in the jail and they give us our jumpsuit things or whatever, and but no one searched us or anything like, I mean, we, Jake could have kept that weed on him and, you know, we could, I could have brought a gun in there for all I know. But I remember walking back through that quarter and we used to have a saying that Danny used to say because, you know, he'd been to jail before. They talk about sweet lady with the big 20s going to be your celly, you know, like whatever. Right. And and I was like, man, what's going to happen if they walk me and Jake together? I'm like, oh, that's cool. He'll be here. But they put him in one pod and me in the other. And as soon as I walked in, I heard a guy from the back, you know, say, all right, another white guy, <laughs> you know. And it turns out me and him were the only white guys in there. But it, it wasn't bad at all, you know. Right. It, it was, nothing happened. I remember um, Jake got a hold of me because you could see the window. There was glass right there. And he's banging on the window. He's like, it's, it's Sunday. Meet me in church. And so we – signed up for church and we right. went and you know and i have to say that the the protestant churches the dry protestant churches i've always attended this had a lot more spirit in it man the guys were really into it and they were praying you know they had a lot to pray for i guess but um you know we were talking about they brought in steve and uh roger and but they came in and got steve like early morning because he was cooperating you know right. and they flew him back to oklahoma city they went to a shop and set up all the cameras and had agents there and he called the people and said hey we got rid of that money we want but he's some the more. one who knew the people right he's the one that brought them in so he was really the connection to them not you guys right you couldn't go and say i'll get call the guy i'll do this you're no no you didn't know anything i mean i i i benefited from someone cooperating but i don't but whatever right i mean i don't I, it doesn't so he set the so they came in put cameras throughout his shop and yeah they got the guy and this the guy was the printer and they caught 3.4 million dollars in 20s and the plates and it was the front page of the paper you know and uh it's quite different from when i used to look at my high school basketball scores and see my name in the paper right. <laughs> but um uh i remember my mom and dad came to visit me and that wasn't fun you know my dad was cool but my mom was crying. I, I'm sure your dad knew this was coming. <laughs> your dad probably was like, oh. I don't think he knew this much. Was felt like I was going to be visiting you in jail at some point. My, you know what? My my basketball coach. The last words he said to me was, "Be careful, your phones might be tapped." <laughs> so that was kind of like an Ides of March thing. I man, I never. I don't know. But, you, you didn't think you were eventually going to end up getting arrested. I mean, not really. I, I, who, how do you know? You know, I, I, I know. I understand. I mean, I, I got good grades in school and was in college. And... <laughs> you try, fucking, you, you're transporting drugs up between the states and throwing shit out and think cops are following you. It's going bad. It's not going good. Um. So, so what happened? Like, what did you end up? Did you end up? Did you get bonded out? I mean, did you? Oh, okay. so they they take us to. This is a funny story. They take us to the magic, the Fort Worth Federal Courthouse. And right. I had my Sid Vicious shirt on. It said, undermine their pompous, blah, blah, blah. And I think one of the jailers said, you don't want to be idea. wearing that shirt. And um, so I, I, I borrowed a shirt from Roger. And it was a tequila, a worm with the tequila, the tequila bottle and a worm or something like that. But um, the, the funny thing about that is, you know, they took us into that holding cell and it reminded me of these old cells that when i used to go visit my dad in ohio you know them them official looking federal courthouse with granite type walls or floors and um but they they called me in to sit down with the clerk and she's asking me all these questions i guess it's a 
a pre-trial report or something like that, yeah, a bond yeah. report. And she's asking me, well, what, who you will be living with? What are the occupations of who you'll be living with? And I tell them about my dad, you know, what he does. And she's like, wow, I don't hear that too often, you know, but then Jake goes in there and does the same. And Jake tells me that as he's sitting in this clerk's office, the magistrate leans his head into the, 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 the door and says, um, what do you think, Stacy? What are our counterfeiters going to be flight risk? And she's like, well, this one here, his father runs all the prisons in Oklahoma and his buddy in the cell, his dad's an FBI agent. So I think we're pretty safe with right. these two. But um, I remember the cell, my dad called me into one of them rooms where, like where you talk to your lawyer. Yeah. And that's when he's letting me have like, what the, f what were you doing? Blah, blah. You know, I'm like, sorry, or whatever, getting defensive. But, um, I think he told him to leave me in that room because you couldn't, you can't open the door. For yeah. Us. And that's when I felt the whole thing of being locked up kicked me. And I'm like, oh, shit. Yeah, it's going to be a lot of locked doors in the future. Yeah. And, it's, but when, and the whole thing, Matt, is I was more worried about facing my dad than. Yeah. Uh, that's, I mean, I don't know if that's respect or fear or, you know, or a combination of both. But, um, and I remember in the cell, there was this old looking white convict dude. Um, and then there was this Nigerian dude. They arrested him for being at the airport and he had like $10,000 cash. He was taken out of the country. And I didn't know that was a crime, you know, I, but I found out it was. But Jake's rapping easy E lyrics <laughs> loud so everyone could hear. And I, I don't know, I thought that was surreal. But they pull us into the courtroom and um, the magistrate, Let's uh, let's us all out on a PR bond. Okay. And I'm sure that has to do with the cooperation, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. But the only funny thing about all that was the uh, the guy, Roger, was this good old Oklahoma boy. And he has a, what do they call it now, politically correct? He has a speech impediment. Right. So they, the magistrate doing us right ask us if we have any questions and this guy roger raises his hand and says your your, your honor if if i go to pr prison can, can i get my teeth fixed <laughs> and i'm just like <laughs> why are you saying that? anyway we got out and that's when my dad's taking me back home where i should have gone before all this happened and say goodbye to my my counterfeiting career, career. Yeah. yeah, and um, uh, I was, I was. Uh, they put me on pre. I had to report to a pretrial off officer, and whatever that was fine. Uh, Jake had a a girl pretrial officer, and Jake was like, "Man, I think she likes me. I'm going to get in her pants." <laughs> and uh, anyway, we had we were waiting, playing the waiting game. I remember too. My dad had a a lawyer friend they played college football with and he was a personal injury lawyer but then the very next day when i got out they had set up a meeting with these these you know crime lawyers you know these high high price defense lawyers and we all met at a denny's and on the way there i was riding with the lawyer guy my dad's friend and we, he had the national news on back when you know when the AM stations would run the loops and our case was on there i was like i was kind of <laughs> <laughs> I'm That's sure your dad was like, hey. Can you, I mean, I, you imagine that, what they he said was it. embarrassed. You know, he tells me, you know, he got a call in the middle of the night from his supervisor, you know. Was, but, um, um, so these, we're sitting at a Denny's. My dad's there and the, the lawyer friend, these two criminal defense, self-important guys. Mm -hmm. And they're wanting to hear this big crime caper. And I'm not going to say nothing with my dad sitting right there. And I mean, I came out as adult, you know, which probably isn't that hard for me. I, they didn't want any part of this case. They're like, man, this ain't. Yeah, yeah. This is, this is low ball. He's not even really looking at yeah. any time. So, um, my, my, um, my dad's buddy ended up handling it. And he charged me like 500 bucks. I had to pay restitution. <laughs> nothing. To, right. For um, a criminal, for a criminal fucking defense. Uh, for a, a federal case that's yeah I, um so um but we had to wait you know it was all up to the prosecutor what 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 we had and i think i waited like six months or a year and uh -huh. probably about six months and he called us in there and he said there was four of us 
one of us was not included in on this deal. And you can guess which one it was, but, uh, you know, he they let us off on something called a pre-trial diversion where you agree to stay out of trouble for a year. Right. And it's, I mean, not, you don't even have to put it on applications or anything like that. So that's what happened to me. Um, after that, I get a job at Little Caesars Pizza and I'm riding my BMX bike to community college trying to do the right thing. But my buddy Jake, he's back in the mix, you know. And uh, he's starting to, to get back in the drug game. And I heard a story through the grapevine about how he had fronted some drugs to this girl and this girl wasn't paying him back and she he was going to leave town so he arranged for this girl to be at another friend's house he was he was having a relationship with this girl's friend and he was going to rob her he had recruited this guy to rob her so they called the girl over to the apartment complex one night jake and the robber are waiting around the corner the guy's not even supposed to have a gun so the guy goes around, robs her. He has a gun. She tries to fight, fight back. You is know, Jake she, with her? No, oh. Jake's there. High, you know, Jake's right, not yeah, there. Jake's like, oh, there, there she is. And she went out. She went out with fighting. You know, she didn't. She didn't punk out. And he, the, the the robber guy, hit her over the head, and the gun went off and killed her. And her name was Cheryl. Respect to her family. I I didn't know her, but. Um, so Jake gets, there's about four or five people involved in this conspiracy. And he's, he, he's like, has none of us ever talked? Oh, that's not possible. Right. We can get away, you know, and, uh, they buried, they threw the gun in the lake or something like that. And he, I heard that like people did talk, like not those five people, but people getting in trouble for other stuff. The cops knew. They just couldn't piece it all together. They never made a case about it. But Jake just keeps on going. And I remember he was he was running a book. You know, he was he was being a bookie uh, for a while, which in Oklahoma that lasts for football season and basketball season. But um, eventually, he got back into the drug game. Right. And him and Aldo built it up and built it up, and they grew and. Uh, he was getting the cops knew there was a there was a local vice cop i think is what they called his drug cop on his tail and they they busted in his room one time and he didn't have drugs on him but they took like 50 grand from him or something like that um the kid david our good friend danny's little brother ended up ODing on coke which which sucks you know respect to him and his family um but jake knew they were after him, and it turned into this game of cops and robbers, you know. And at this point, he was he was up to full keys. He was flipping keys, and it was kind of like a multi-level marketing thing where he would come into town. He knew he was being watched, so he would he had he would he had six people under him, six runners, whatever you want to call it. Right. So he would all give them six ounces. They would give him back six grand, grand an ounce. So he would turn twenty into. 36 and um the paper said that he was doing several kilograms a month and in oklahoma city is a it's a small big city right so when you get a name for yourself you know you the rate your reputation it, it, people talk you know right cops thieves whatever you know they they knew then they didn't hide their stuff at all everyone knew what they were doing they high rolled it they might as well have had tattoos that say i sell drugs you know right. but um um along this time when jake knew that he was being watched he didn't keep the stuff on him but there was a spot we used to hang out out in the country and he would bury his stuff there and his six people that sold for him he wouldn't they would meet him there and that's where they divvy up divvy it up well, one day he had stashed a kilo there and it was gone so he knew it had to be one of those six people that was under him so he went to them all and he said look man i know you stole my stuff right and you need to rob a bank to pay me back and it worked 
the guy that did it. It's like you got me. <laughs> yeah. And this guy was. Uh, oh my god. This How'd guy. You know. This guy was. I mean, <laughs> I, the way I say, it, if you met this guy, I mean, I know you're a master manipulator, you devil, you but. Y'all, I'm sure well, you just talked about prison and there's got full of guy. I can only imagine all the the Jedi mind tricks going on in that place, right? <laughs> Everybody in there's a hustler, yeah. So it's, it's running game. Yeah. So so what um so so this guy, his name, his name is Jamie. He's dead now. I don't I'm not making up a fake name. And he was known to be the toughest guy on the north side of Oklahoma City. He was just kind of crazy. I think he was a little mentally off, but Anyway, the way Jake tells me the story is that one day, you know, he put the bug in the ear about robbing a bank. So one day him and it's Aldo's little brother, and I'm going to name him Sancho in this story. It's not his real name, but Latino people might understand why I say this in, in towards the end. But um, he says that him and Sancho, Jake and Sancho picked up Jamie, and they were just cruising, going somewhere, and they passed by this bank. And Jamie's like, pull over here. And he pulls out like a president mask and a gun. And he says, I'm going to rob this bank to get you your money back. And uh, y'all just turn around and wait for me. And so he jumps out of the car and Jake's like, no, we're leaving. You know, They're, they didn't sign up for this shit. So, But I thought Jake told him to rob a bank. He told him to, but not with him right. as an accomplice. So, uh I think he when when Jamie went into the bank that he said you know gives the teller a note and she looks at him and his president Max and starts laughing <laughs> at him but she did give him the money and he told me this crazy story how they took off and Jamie ended up running to Jake's house which was like a mile a mile and a half away <laughs> and you know he had the blue dye all over him and so he's and then for some reason he got spooked and called his girlfriend to pick him up. And even though they'd kind of shut the grid down, they decided it'd be wise to drive right back by the scene of the crime. And that's where they caught this guy in his underwear with blue dye all over him. But I later read that he got caught pretty much right at the site. I don't know why Jake told me this story. I think he was yeah. preparing a story just like the Secret Service if he gets interviewed by the cops or something like right, that. Like, I, so he, so I wasn't even there. He, he jumped, I, I dropped him off, but didn't realize what he was going to do. And I left and had no part of it. I, I think he was practicing on me. You know, he, uh, right. what, what is it pathological when you believe your own? Right. We can't help but lie. Yeah. You're constantly lying. It, it's it, a great salesman. Right. So salesmen are great at that, right? Um, so, so the guy got caught right away. He basically, what really happened was he got ran out of the bank and got caught, right? And um, because of the dye patch, I, yeah, that's what the paper said. Okay. The, Jake's story is better, but right. Um, um, well, it's, his Jake's story is not that much different. The only difference is the guy left and came back. And got I, caught. I don't know why his but his reason for making that story. I mean, it had to be something he was covering up, but um. I don't know. I mean, a crazy thing, kind of an interlock to all this and how it all ties together is the guy that investigated that bank robbery was my dad's old partner in the FBI. And Jake told me they sat down and he asked him what he knew about this robbery. And he says, you know, it sucks, man. That guy's crazy. And he's like, the guy's like, well, can we play you a recording? And this was a recording from Jamie's answering machine. And it's Jake saying, man, when are you going to hit that bank like we talked about? <laughs> <laughs> and Jake's like, he got a shit-eating grin, and he's like, I want to wear, you know. But uh, it's just that, that that agent, his son used to play on a Little League basketball team that we played on. So I would think the agent, your name would have come up um, on Jake's alias list. Like you would have been listed as somebody – I would think when he looked at it, he would have been like, oh, wait a minute. This is my ex-partner's. I think he, they, I right. think, like I said, I think when we first started all this, I think it was circling around and, you know, it's weird. Sometimes you think that a cop knows someone that has potential. They let them kind of rise up and they'll say it's for gathering evidence, you know, to follow right. the chain. Right. But, it, you know, I think that 
or you could say that the cops waiting to it makes better headlines it makes him look better you know you see both sides of it but i think people knew <laughs> i don't know how i don't know I so mean, what happened where's where's where jake now jake's doing good <laughs> <laughs> Really, I mean, yeah, but we don't. We, we're not nearly as close as what. Um, Jaking it up, catching a case. He had a federal, state, local task force for him for drugs. Okay, and I, I mean, I just imagine in this, you know, like in the movies where you see, like crimes, and they're pointing. You know, they have yeah, to, yeah. and all there's all these. Think about the trajectory of crime. I mean, all by this kid. You know, you have murder. You have. Right. The largest counterfeit bust, a bank robbery, and a big old drug case all pointed to this one guy. But um, he ended up getting busted, you know. I and uh, they caught him when you know they busted in the hotel rooms. How much? Well, how much time did he get? He got ten years. We got about nine years, but he cooperated. He set up his guy. I, I mean, I he they were handing out big sentences. You know, he right. could have got twenty or thirty. I'm sure if he wouldn't cooperate or took it to trial. So he does his time, and God, I got all kinds of stories. I'll tell you one. So he self surrendered. Okay, and I heard you talking on the last show about you wonder about people why they self surrender, why they don't just run and make them catch him or whatever. But Jake ended up. His dad got him a job at some small town sewer department. So he he joked and said he went from high rolling to shoveling shit, basically. But Jake being Jake, he befriended this, fell in love with this beautiful, blonde, young Oklahoma country girl. And um, uh, I think he you know, they were get, getting married. But uh, he talked about, he got the call to surrender. It was about a year. We took a trip to Vegas, which was kind of cool. You know, your buddy's going away for 10 years. But um, so he's, it's his last weekend of freedom. So him and his girl, they're partying. They're having a good time. And he bought her some lingerie. And she in turn bought him like a little, you know, one of them stripper purple banana hammock type thongs to wear or whatever. And so they did their thing. He gets dropped off at county. Jake worked out. He's all yoked up, you know. He can handle himself, but he said in county, you can't work out. Food sucks. You got scrawny. But he got to call the report to his prison. But, you know, when they have you stripped to your skivvies, the only skivvies he had was this thong thingy that his girlfriend bought him. So, <laughs> I don't know. It's not the best way to go in. But, you know, he's not... He's the kind of guy that handles his business, you know, and he doesn't, I don't mean, but he has crazy prison stories. So he did his time, gets out. He, I went to go visit him when he was in Fort Worth for the last little part, Fort Worth Medical, which is where that Tiger Joe guy is now. But yeah. that's a trip to visit your friend in, in, in prison. It was just kind of crazy. But he ended up, he, he ran a book. That was his hustle when he was in Fort Worth. And he ran it for this big, famous bookie out of Oklahoma named Pody Poe. Pody Poe used to have an underground casino in the old money section of Oklahoma City called Nichols Hills for for years. And like the mayor, football, everyone knew about it, but they finally busted him on it. But, you know, he would talk about sweating out games and these guys, you know, they have nothing to, but time, so they get real good at picking games yeah. and all of that stuff. But um, uh, when he gets out, he gets into a business that a lot of cons get get into. I'm not going to say it because he's still in that business and right. it's kind of a public business, but killing it, crushing it, making six figures within within um, two years. He marries this beautiful girl that looks like Audrey Hepburn. They have a baby. They're, um, he's driving a Lexus. He just closed on a brand new house out in the suburbs. Well, his friend, Sancho, got arrested in Oklahoma City on minor drug charges. Like he stole his girlfriend's camera and pawned it. So he's got to get high so bad. He tells him all, all the details about that murder. So Jake gets out of feds, works his way, has his whole life set and, the same cop comes get him for this murder charge, and they're they're charging him capital murder, drug kingpin. I mean, the death penalty was on the table. So, this is a recent. 
This was in between his prisons. prisons. So he did 10 years in the Fed. He got out early 30s. So he's mid to early 30s. Started over, doing fine. They come in with this other one. What he, happened he's with that? He's gone away. They're, you know, he, um, well, he got, he hired a lawyer. His family hired a lawyer. He hired a lawyer, whatever. But good lawyers. You know, I can only imagine his family. This is the second murder trial that they've been to with their sons. It's right. And they're all good people. And, you know, I know they're all doing well. But, um, he, the whole thing was, in his case, the crux of it was, whether or not he knew the guy had a gun. And if he, they, they would have proven that he would have got a gun, he would have got life, murder in the first degree. But he got murder in the second degree. But during his trial, Sancho, the same guy that snitched him out, which Jake snitched on his drug case, so kind right, of right, right. Yeah, yeah. started having an affair with Jake's wife, the mother of his child, and they were walking in the court. Can you imagine? So, so what happened? What did he end up getting? Got murdered in the second degree. He got twenty five years. You so, started this off saying he was doing fine. Well, he, where I'm fifty, we're fifty four. He did ten years. He did in state. He did half of it. He did twelve and a half years. He's out. <laughs> I was gonna say your 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 definition of fine and well, my he, definition. Of, so you're saying now he got out. So he got out on the second one. Now he's doing fine. Making six figures. That's why. I mean, he's like you. He's a winner. You know. Uh, he, okay he's like you know he had lands I, on his feet and still I mean, he did not mean for these are decisions that he made very young he didn't mean for that person yeah. to get killed oh no i i i you know that always kills me is that like and unfortunately this is the way it works and people don't realize how it works like if i if i say hey look man you know if i say colby bro like that dude oh, this guy over here you know he knows me and he knows that i know he's got money in the house so what, but he doesn't know you and doesn't know that I know you. So why don't you get one of your buddies and you guys break in that house and get the money? He's in there. He doesn't have a gun. He doesn't have nothing, but he's in there alone. He's got $50,000 in cash. It's under the bed. And, and Colby goes, oh, okay, cool, cool. Yeah, I'll do it. Colby grabs one of his buddies. They run up. They kick in the fucking door. They happen to have a gun. They get into a fucking, they get into a, a fight. The guy resists. He ends up getting shot. I'm charged with murder. Because even though I'm like, even if I told Colby specifically, typically, typically, it depends on what state, in the feds and in Florida, typically what happens is even if I told Colby, don't bring a gun, and Colby goes, man, I, don't worry, I got you, I'm not going to bring a gun, Colby brings a gun anyway. Guess what? I'm going to get charged with murder. You hear about like kids from the inner city yeah. that happened, and they're just long for the ride. And I think that a lot of that, Depends on the affluent. I mean, if you have enough money to hire a team versus a public defender. <laughs> yeah. and But yeah, because in both of these cases, other people could have been, you know. Yeah. So, so listen, I, I know a guy who was driving a car for his brother. He was driving his car, the car. His brother and a friend went to go rob a drug dealer. Well, it wasn't a drug dealer. It was a D, DEA had set it all up. They didn't realize they wow. run into a well, a you know, into a, a whatever, a, a stash house to rob a drug dealer that was never there. There was never any money. As soon as they get out and they're running towards the, the, the house, the cops jump out of the house. They jump out of the house next to it. They pull cars, pull up. The kid starts hearing shots being fired. He panics and hits the gas and takes off. They pin him in with the car. He gets out of the car, starts running. One of the, one of the DEA agents shoots him. Doesn't even have a gun. Shoots him, blows his leg off at, his, at the knee. Boom, hits the ground. His brother died. The other guy died. He lost his leg. He got 30 years. He was charged with murder because he was driving the vehicle and his brother got killed. So they basically charged him. I think they just charged him with his brother's murder. I don't think the other guy got murder. I think he survived. So they charged him with murder. Because there was a there was a a death during a robbery that you were a part of, even though it's like yeah, but I, my brother didn't kill anybody. They killed my brother. Doesn't matter who died on either side. You got charged with it, and he lost his leg. 
He was like in his. He was like nineteen or twenty years old it's, when I met him. It's it's so scary. It's like what I was just driving the car, and right, then right. I didn't. And, right. and uh, if you met the guy, he was just this, you know, do do. Not you know, not not a not. He wasn't like he was simpleton or anything. But he was he was just a nice kid. He was a black, nice black, thin black kid wheeling himself around in a wheelchair. Like he was sitting on the couch one day when his brother came in and said, bro, I need you to drive the car. I need you to drive the car. And he was, he'd never been in trouble. He was like, fuck, you know, and his brother was like, come on, man, it's nothing. Drive the car. The guy, nobody's even in the house. We're going to run up, get him the door, rob the place, leave. It's not a big deal. He was like, he's like, so I did it. It's That's horrible. it. It's over. 30 years. That sucks, man. Yeah. Oh, on a violent crime. You're going to do 85% of your time in the fed, in a wheelchair. Oh, I mean, the equity under the law thing. And I mean, it, there is none in my opinion, but uh, it's a harsh system, bro. It's harsh. It's t- the funny thing is the first time it's nonviolent. The first time it's typically not that harsh, but the second time it's brutal. And if it's violent, it's brutal, pretty much typically brutal the first time. So, but Hey, you know, I, nobody's asking my opinion. Um, so what's going on? What are you doing? What are you doing now? Man, I wrote a, I wrote a very rough draft about all this. I had a couple years off. I've been a over the road truck driver for 15 years. So salute to all your drivers out there. It's, I have it's a hard work. Who, yeah. I was gonna say, I have a buddy who does it. Uh, Mike Hudson. Every time I talk to him, he gripes and screams and bitches and moans about it. He's it's hard. Fuckers. Yeah. I mean, I was a road warrior. I was a trainer, so I would work 330 days out of the year, and I had to train students that right. you don't know who you're getting. But, we, I mean, I ran, ran coast to coast, and then I bought my own truck and ran the oil fields, which I got pulled over in South Texas a few months ago four times in 12 days on random inspections because the board, the governor's protecting our border somehow by – pulling over sand trucks and and get inspecting us but the, the the trooper told us we know you guys run 24 hours in in the right. oil fields it's it's crazy man and but that's what i've been i mean i've worked my whole life had a couple ex-wives you know the uh, um oh my god it's truck driving that's just that's horrible bro like it mike hudson does it and mike's like you couldn't do it you couldn't do it <laughs> You, you remember Mike? Mike, so I'm like, boy, it seems hard, Mike. It's too hard for you. You couldn't do it. Oh, God, Mike. I, He's it, a tough guy. It, I loved it. It's it, for a scammer because you're always plotting. You're you're trying. When we had paper log books, yeah. I mean, it, you, you, people wouldn't understand, but you're just constantly, how can I manipulate this right. time, time, time? And as a trainer, I worked for a company that had a lot of freight, so the trainers kind of they can we can run more time so you become the the elite and the little solo drivers here's matt driving he's got a good load but there's a trainer a shark coming and i i try to get your load because i can take it farther and i don't know it's it's, it's hard work but I, I i liked it and but when things aren't going Plus it's right, dangerous like people get hurt all the time guys get into a car like you get into a car accident in a fucking truck like it's you you could be killed like it's imagine you have to trust this guy that you've never met that's driving your truck out of driving school <laughs> yeah it's i was a trader for seven years i met all kinds of crazy some mostly cool guys just to hear stories from all over the country a few of the mentally ill ones they're you gotta stay live with them it's like having a celly i think you know it's smaller than a prison cell but um i met some cool cats met met a guy from D.C. that did time. I don't know if you've ever heard of Lorton Prison. It was, mm-hmm. you know, D.C. doesn't have a jail. It's not a state. Yeah, so not, they it's all, all federal. Right. They all, before that, they had a prison called Lorton. It was in Virginia, and he called it the most corrupt prison in America. But uh, this guy was like an inner city kingpin, and he had so many stories, you know, and the happiest guy I've ever met, you know. He never got mad or anything, but it was... It was cool. That that's what I've been doing. Uh, I I had to. I literally jumped off a truck. I just got fed up with it. So I had a couple years off, and my my mom's getting older. So I've been helping with her take take care. I've done a lot of cooking and 
finding TV shows for my mom because she she can't figure out the streaming stuff and right a lot of chick flicks and uh, working stuff out in my head like writing writing the story and writing your life story. I think you mentioned you did that when yeah. you were. It's very therapeutic. It's very cathartic. You look back at things and see them in a different light. I, I hope so. I'm in a good place. I guess as good as I've ever been. Okay. I was nervous on this thing, so right. but I tried. Thank well, you for having me. Thank yeah. you for showing any interest at all. And you can you think of anything we didn't cover? We're good. I feel like <laughs> I could talk a lot of stuff, but you said to keep it on topic. Uh, hey, I appreciate you guys watching. If you like the video, do me a favor, share the video because that really does help with the algorithm, even more so than leaving a comment. So share the video with your friends and family. Do me a favor and uh, subscribe to the channel. Hit the bell. You know, leave me a comment. Uh, we're gonna leave any links that um, that Kyle has uh, in the description box. And I really do appreciate you guys watching. Thank you very much. See ya. No, I was uh, born in Miami. Grew up in Clearwater, Tampa area. Um, I moved to Knoxville, Tennessee, probably about eight years ago. Okay. And that's where I caught my case was in, in Knoxville. All right. Um, so, so what, so where, so you were in, I mean, what, mom, dad, like, um, you know, I had a good childhood for the most part, kind of got into like drugs and street life at a younger age, you know? Um, but I'd say when I was about 25, I met my ex-wife um, and, you know, kind of went straight for a while. Right. We, um, well, I mean, we, so you graduated high school. You were, what were you doing after high school? Oh, uh, <laughs> just. I mean, you said went, you went, you said went yeah, straight was, makes it seem you know, like you were doing selling, something. Selling drugs. Oh, okay. That was uh, in, in, in high school or after high school or. In high school, after high school, um, you know, started selling weed not really on any like big scale right and then the pills kind of hit um tampa area right oxys yeah um and you know i was selling lots of oxys and developed a, a habit to say the least um, right you know but I, I was counterfeiting a little bit when i was younger um kind of toyed with it and never on not on like a huge scale but, you know, I couldn't get the bills perfect, but I was selling them and making a little bit of money and then did that for like a year and then stopped. Right. When you say younger, how, how young? Like 19, 20. Right. What, what were you using then? Just basic equipment over the counter? Or? Yeah, yeah. I mean, even, even recently I was using, you know, I didn't have like printing presses and, you know what I mean? It's all digital nowadays. Like right. the capability of uh, digital printers has like advanced extremely yeah. in the past 10 years. Um, and that's what the secret service was like wondering, uh, how I got the bills to look so good with just regular, you know, 200, $300 printers, but I'm a graphic designer. So a lot of it has to do with like breaking the images down and sharpening them on, right. on the digital file. Well, so, so you were basically, you were just kind of like selling drugs and make ends meet and you would counterfeit a little bit, but you said, then you met your, your wife and stopped or yeah, I, I met, uh, my wife, um, so we decided to move to, to Knoxville because um, my parents moved up to, in that area. Her mom lived up in North Georgia. So we were just kind of getting out of Florida. Um, <clears throat> and I, you know, got a job in the sign business, was doing doing good, you know. I mean, I still had a, a drug habit, but it, I've always been functioning, you know what I mean? Right. Uh, kept a job and a house and everything. You know, I've got kids. so. Um, but at this sign company, I ended up, wrecking a truck so i had a newborn baby it was like you know those late nights tired i got called into work um i worked like 80 hours that week with a newborn baby at home like not sleeping so i was doing a service call in a bucket truck and wrecked the truck because i fell asleep at the wheel so basically that like they let me go at that job because of that or whatever reason um and uh and this was like two months before our lease was up in our house too. So I lost my job, didn't have a lot of money saved, 
So that's kind of what put me back into the counterfeiting thing. I was like, well, I've got two months to figure out a new house, a new house and, you know, a way to make money. So I kind of just said, fuck it. Let's go back to, to this and do it on a larger scale. Um, so I, within those two months before my lease was up, I basically just stayed at home on the computer 10, 12 hours a day, like, uh, you know, making these digital images as sharp and clean. So, like, uh, to prevent counterfeiting, you can't scan a, a picture of a bill or print one because the printer, like, recognizes that image and it just, it'll print, like, just a little bit of it and then just stop. Really? Yeah. So, you nice. instead of scanning the pictures, I'd just take a photo and then upload that photo, which kind of got around that security measure that the printers have. Um, and then, like, with graphic design, I would take that image and break it down to, like, three or four different images. So so it would print it. So the printer wouldn't recognize the bill because you're, you're taking the background color and having one image that's just the background color of the bill. And then another image with the, the serial numbers and treasury seal. And then another image with all the black work. And you're just running the paper through over and, and yeah, over again. Three, I printed three prints for the front of the bill and two prints for the back of the bill. And then I uh, printed the strip and the watermark on the back of the back. So then I could then glue the two pieces together and the, you know, the strip and watermark would be embedded in them. How are you getting this strip? I just printed it. So I was using, like, and this, the Secret Service said that this was like a, a large key to my success was I was using Bible paper to uh, print the bills on. How, how, did, how did you figure out how to use Bible paper? Trial and error. <laughs> Lots of, uh, so like, I've read uh, The Art of Making Money. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, and, you know, he was sandwiching too. I think he What's was his name? Art? Art Williams. Williams, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I um, knew a, I had a buddy who was uh, locked up with him. Oh, yeah? Yeah. He um, said when he, after, when the book came out, he said Art was walking around passing out. The, he, was, he said, man, he would tell everybody that, about the, yeah. the book and he was, um, that yeah. was a good book. It was a, it was a good book. I read it in prison. Yeah, that's what uh, originally gave me the idea to start counterfeiting when I was like 19. I was reading that book, um, but I knew he he sandwiched two pieces together. I think he was using like a, like telephone book paper or newsprint or some kind of other thin. I, I know he had through trial and he had got eventually. I knew he was ordering the paper. Yeah, and he couldn't he couldn't order the exact size paper that the that the um uh that they were using for bills. So he figured, okay fuck it, I'll, I'll order half the size and just yeah. glue them together. And that'll give me the ability to inside of it to be able to glue the, also glue the... Um, See, I think a large portion of his uh, deal was he was trying to find paper that would mark yellow with the counterfeit pen. See, I, I found kind of a way around that. So like the Bible paper was thin enough to sandwich two sheets together and opaque enough to where you couldn't see the strip and watermark through it unless you held it up to the light. So it was... And... Uh, for some reason, certain kinds of Bible paper aren't like bleached. So if you put it in a black light, it glows that dull purple, just like real money. Right. As opposed to like all other papers glow that bright blue, like fluorescent color. Um, so basically, Bible paper was like perfect. I mean, it, it, it was opaque. It was thin. It, it glowed right in a black light. And it, it didn't mark with the pen, though. So I would spray it with a matte lacquer spray to create a barrier. Because counterfeit pens are iodine-based ink. So, like, the iodine in the ink reacts with the starch in the paper. So, by spraying it with lacquer, you create a barrier. So, right. there's no chemical reaction between the iodine pen and the paper. So, and, and that helped. Like, it seems like every security feature I beat uh, solved multiple issues. You know what I mean? Which was just, it, they exponentially got better every time I... So, like, the lacquer spray not only helped with the, the counterfeit pen... But it also gave it that crisp texture, like real thin. You know, if you yeah. spray it with lacquer and just take an iron to it real quick. Yeah, it becomes crispy. And then hold and spray another coat of lacquer from a distance. It would feel like sandpaper. And then you take it and just go on the edge of a table. And it, it crisped up and it, it knocked off that gritty sandpaper feel but gave it that texture. People would scratch the, to feel the texture in the ink and stuff. So it... So it felt like paper. It, I mean, felt like money. Looked like money. Oh, yeah. It marked. 
mm-hmm. it, it it beat the black light and and you could see through it just like normal money. So it was just it was basically flawless. I mean, from the you brought paperwork from the Secret Service and your discovery and stuff. So mm-hmm. how long did it take you to figure all that out, though? Um, like so within the two months that like my lease was up, I got fired. I had two months to figure stuff out. So within those two months, I uh, I don't remember exactly how the Bible paper came apart. It was just kind of trial and error. I was looking for thin paper, and I basically just one day felt it and was like, oh, this is thin. I tried it, and it worked great. So, um, you know, within those two months, I edited the images. I broke them down, zoomed in, got rid of all the gray, fuzzy, you know, like sharpened the images. Because really it was well. a photo. Yeah. Um, which, I mean, high-resolution cameras take pretty good photos already. But to, to – so, like, each print has to be color-matched. If, if you just print, like, the picture of a $100 bill, the colors will be off because in order to get the, the, the green on the treasury seal and serial numbers correct, the background color will be off right. and vice versa. Yeah, cool, because so, it's printed on paper that's slightly colored and has yeah. fibers and all the other stuff, right? Yeah, so that's trying, like the paper – I believe they they use like just dyed paper, but I'm printing the background color, so you, you got to match that to money. You know what I mean? Right. Um, so you know, in those two months, I after it took well, it took more than two months. I started kind of doing it after two months and making money. Um, a buddy of mine that worked at the sign company with me, uh, like so, one of my buddies called me and was like, because like I said, I had a drug problem at the time. You know, on top of being <laughs> broken, no job. And uh, having a, you know, at least a hundred, two hundred dollar a day heroin habit. Right. Four kids, you know. Um, <laughs> but a buddy of mine called me and was like, you know, if you if you need any any dope, call this dude. I'm not gonna say the name because you know. Right. A buddy of mine at the sign company. I knew he sold a little bit of weed, and uh, but I didn't know, you know, the extent or anything because we were just working together. So he got fired from the sign company. I got fired. So I called him one day and went over to his house to get some some stuff and uh you know he was way bigger of a drug dealer than i thought you know what i mean like he was dealing in multiple uh you know like meth heroin coke weed right all sorts he's a professional (laughs) yeah so i and i I ran it by him i was like you know i'm starting to to print some money again you know what i mean maybe you could use it to re-up in atlanta because i at this point i was nervous about spending on myself i i Always wanted to just sell them to people. Right. Um, you didn't want to go into a store, hand somebody, and then they go, oh, hold on a yeah. second. The security I mean, guard shows up and arrests you. Or the whatever. bills got progressively better. So, like, each bill, I'm I'm hand-making. So, it's like you're cutting them out. You're spraying it. You're squeegeeing and gluing. And then using uh, – I was using holographic green eyeshadow to paint on the color shifting 100. Right. Um, so, like – the more you do it, the more practice you get and the better they look. So in the beginning, I I wasn't I knew they looked good. They were passable. But like I, I was still nervous about going into stores and shopping. You know what I mean? So I started giving this guy, this drug dealer, bills to go to Atlanta and, uh, you know, buy drugs. So he started doing that. Um, and eventually, like this, this only lasted probably three or four months. Um, but he got his house got raided. So, so I, what, what is, so if you're giving him 10,000 or 5,000, I don't know how much you're giving him to buy the drugs. If you're giving him 10,000, like what percentage of actual money are you getting in return for that? About 20% usually. Okay. So I mean, it was, him- it was circum. he was a friend of mine. So yeah. if he, if he was five grand short on re-upping, I may just give it to him and he, you know, but then another time he I'd give him 10, he'd give me, you know, 2500 or, right. or whatever. It's usually about 20 cents on the dollar, 25 cents. Um but that only lasted a few months. Um and I was kind of like perfecting the bills as I was working with him. Um I was giving him a lot of fake 20s. I was doing 20s too at that time because those the 20s I wasn't putting strips in or anything. Those I was just printing on regular paper with no strips or watermarks. Cause he was just mixing it in with large sums of money to re-up. Right. Um, the hundreds, obviously, people tend to scrutinize more, and I, those need security features all on beat. But um, but he got arrested. His house got raided. Um, and one of his charges was possession of counterfeit money. So it made me kind of nervous. You know what I mean? I don't, you, know, I, you don't know if... 
I, I, I heard that he might be cooperating, of course. I mean, you know, you never know. Um, and, like, I'd say, well, no, this was before the lease was up. So after a couple months, I was doing it for a couple months, and then he got arrested. And the, I was at my house one day, and we we missed the trash. You know, we didn't bring the trash by the road one morning. And right. I, I know that's how, uh, you know, the Secret Service gets a, tries to get a search warrant. If they suspect you're counterfeiting, they'll go through your trash cans first to right. look for evidence, you know. So I'd always bag up my trash separately, like all the counterfeiting. I had like an office with, you know, different color shifting sprays, ventilation to, to spray it with lacquer indoors. and um, But I'd bag up all the trash, you know, separately. But... About a week after he got arrested, I noticed the trash truck was, it was like trash picked up on a Monday, and this was like a Wednesday, and it was just parked outside of my house. So I'm like, that's weird. I'm like, oh, can you take, I forgot to bring the trash down. Can you take this? We can't throw it in. Absolutely we they, can. Boom, dump it in. It was empty. You could tell it made a big sound. And then they just drove off, and like a black blacked out Suburban <laughs> drove off after him. So that like spooked me, you know what I mean? I knew there was no no counterfeiting evidence in there, but still it, you know. You know you're being watched. It it appeared that way. So um which the secret service in Knoxville said, I mean, I after I got arrested, I asked them if that was them, if they knew it, they didn't admit to it. I don't know if they would though, but Right. But anyway, so then my lease was up, so I was like, fuck this, I'm not even getting a new house. I'm going to go all in with this money thing and we'll just stay at a hotels. You know. Um so we started living at a hotels, um, and I just met multiple different drug dealers, and and usually I'd, uh, you know, rip them off basically. Like th- there were a few at the end that I was honest with them about the bills, but like usually I'd just go buy heroin from these drug dealers, and you know I'd get them for five grand, ten grand worth of heroin. Right, so you, you're giving them fi- you're giving five grand of fake bills, getting five thousand in heroin, and then you're selling reselling yeah. the heroin. I mean, yeah, doing right. it, selling it, whatever yeah. you know. Um, well, I mean, I'm assuming you're making some. You got to be making money. You're you're living in a hotel. Oh yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah. I mean, of course. Well, that's and and by this point, so I started like the first time I I actually went in and broke a bill. It was in a, a Taco Bell, which. Now I know, like, you don't go to fast food restaurants because a lot of those places have the safes under there with, like, bill validators. It's basically like a vending machine safe. Right. That's how they deposit money is you put it through this bill validator. And uh, my bills didn't work in in that because it detects, like, infrared and magnetic ink and all these other security features. So, but at the time, I didn't know that because I just started breaking them. I went into a Taco Bell at, like, midnight before they closed, and she just held it up. I bought like two tacos. She gave me ninety five dollars. So right. I was like, hey. "Nice." I was, you know, was nervous at first, but it worked without a problem at all. So, did they ever figure it out later? Like, because you have photos and stuff of yeah, <laughs> of yeah, you well, passing bills. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, that was. I don't know if that was one of them. You're saying no? No, no. no. That, okay. Um, eventually, you know, the whatever store they get a counterfeit bill. At the end of the week, the armored truck will come pick up their deposit, take it to the bank, and then the bank will realize that this money's fake. Right. But then they only have a window of, okay, we got this counterfeit bill within this week of time. Yeah, so they don't have any how many idea. Hundred dollar yeah. bills. Does it's it, not worth. It's not worth. You'd have to review a week's worth of footage. Even to, them, you're not getting your hundred bucks back. Exactly. So now I spent six hundred dollars reviewing or a thousand dollars reviewing yeah, you're gonna footage. Pay a federal a special agent to sit there for yeah. a week reviewing footage. Yeah. So you just hit. Yeah, I felt pretty confident that uh, I could just start shopping right. at that point. Um, so, you know, basically me and my wife. Hey, but the, the problem was finding the Bible paper because um, uh, I tried to buy it in bulk online, but apparently there's there's only three manufacturers of Bible paper and you have to buy it in the world. There's three and you have to buy it in like giant reams, right? which was just not, you know. Boss. Didn't want to do that. I didn't want a paper trail of, you know, receiving a pallet of Bible paper, you know. Right. Um, so I'd go on road trips to, uh, you know, Atlanta, Chattanooga. I was in Knoxville. I went to every bookstore. I was Googling bookstore, Barnes & Noble, Books A Million, going there and just ripping out the, the <laughs> blank four to 10 to 20 blank pages in the back. So like in a, in a Bible section at a Barnes & Noble, say there's 100 Bibles with 
you know, four to 10 sheets in each one. I mean, that one bookstore is worth a hundred grand right. know, worth of paper. So, uh, but eventually that, you know, eventually I literally ripped out every blank page of every Bible from Atlanta to Cleveland, Ohio, you know? So I started paying, uh, maintenance men at hotel. I went, I was living out of hotels. So every day I'd check into a new hotel room and take at least a two, three, four blank pages out of the Bible in the, the nightstand. And uh, one day we checked into a hotel and there was no Bible there. So I, I saw the maintenance guy and I was like, hey, let me get the Bible. I was like, you don't keep Bibles in the rooms anymore? He's like, no, we've got boxes of them in the, in the maintenance closet. So I was like, let me buy those Bibles. I'm like, I'll give you a gram of dope, a hundred bucks, whatever. Let me get those boxes of Bibles. So we were paying maintenance guys to, you know, just bring us all the Bibles from each hotel. Right. Um, and one of my, the co-conspirator that set me up was going up to Cleveland, Ohio to buy drugs. And he was paying maintenance guys at hotels to, you know, I was giving him fake money. He was going up there to buy heroin and come back with heroin and Bible paper. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, well, <laughs> <laughs> the guy that, uh, and what happened? The guy that set me up, I I ended up like meeting him from uh, just well, buying. How long did this go on for? About two years. So for two years you're living in hotels. Uh, yeah, pretty much hopping around. See, like with counterfeiting, you gotta you have to move around. You yeah, know what I mean, you don't want to sit. Which that was a mistake of mine was spending too much in Knoxville. Um, which that was the reason I, I got caught was cause guys set me up, up in Cleveland, Ohio. Right. But, um, still just in retrospect, I was spending too much money in Knoxville. I spent like $400,000 in fake bills in, in Knoxville in the course of like a year and a half. So, um, but, uh, so did, did you ever see the movie to live and die in LA? No, I've, I've heard of it and I, oh, it's you've William got Defoe and he was oh. printing money. Uh, yeah. Oh, you gotta see that yeah. movie. It's a great movie. Yeah, I'd like to see that. I know about it. I've, I've been meaning to watch it, but yeah, I mean I it's it's have. old. Yeah, like how old are you? Thirty-five. Uh, Fuck, it's probably 25, 30 years old. But it was the eighties, I think. Yeah, but it'd be great though. You'd love it. You'd yeah. love it. This guy's like super professional, but you know, yeah. it's also there's this. It's dangerous. You know, you 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 realize. I mean, I've just tons of fucking money. It's, it's a dangerous. It can be a dangerous situation. And he's being. They they know they're they're tracking him. They're all over mm -hmm. him. They're. And he knows everything. He knows their tactics, and he knows what they can do and what they can't do. Like he literally knows he's talking to FBI agents. Yeah. Or are they secret? I think they, I think they I think have. Back their, then it was FBI. FBI. Well, I, or and no, the Secret Service always would have been counterfeit. Always been counterfeit, <laughs> but it, it's still F. It, and the thing I think they're FBI, but regardless, mm -hmm. only because people don't realize Secret Service. I have people. When I get arrested, they're like, Secret Service, Cox is lying. He wasn't arrested by the Secret <laughs> Service. They only they only um protect the president. Protect the president yeah. or and 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 US money and they wouldn't be after him. He's lying. It's like, motherfucker, you shut no, you don't know what you're Secret fucking talking about. Secret Service took over like all financial crimes. Right. They? Especially <laughs> if it deals with identity theft. Yeah. Like any financial crimes crime can still be investigated by the FBI, but if identity theft is involved, it almost always gets shifted to the Secret, Secret Service. Service yeah. But regardless, um, yeah, gr I mean, great movie. You got to watch that movie. I'm sorry. Uh, sorry. Um, sorry. You got to watch that movie. <laughs> I, I'd like to watch it. Um, so one of these guys I was buying heroin from, I got probably got him for like $10,000 over the course of a few weeks. Um, and these guys <laughs> never come back on you? We'll see. A lot of times I'd, I'd do that, get about five, ten grand worth, and then, and then just stop, stop dealing calling with that guy. Because, right. you know, you don't know if, if you buy 500 bucks worth of dope from somebody and it's fake, you call them the next day to buy 500 more dollars, you know, you don't know. Some of these guys might have found out and are fucking pissed and trying to set you up. Yeah, that you show up and they got a gun. So you really you know. have to be able to read people over the phone and kind of, you know, which... Eventually, when people did find out, they weren't even mad because they were, you know, they, they'd hold them up. These drug dealers would think they were real and then they'd go re-up with it or go shopping and spend them. And they, they always worked. So even when they yeah. found out, like, oh, these bills were fake, you've been giving me nothing but fake bills. Like, 
they'd laugh because they didn't lose any money. You know what I mean? They'd right. be like, this white boy just got me for 10 grand. Like, right. more power to you. You know what I mean? So this one guy in particular, um, you know, I came, uh, well, I, I, at one point I did rent a, a little house. I had roommates and we were staying in the house for a couple months. But so at that point. Where's the wife at this point? She's with me. I mean, okay. we're traveling around, you know what I mean? With the kids and the hotels and Bro. shopping. Every, I mean, that was the, my job was to, you know, basically wake up in the morning. Go spend money. Print, make, you know, say 2500 bucks. Go shopping, spend it all, get real money, get a hotel room, tape paper to to do the printing part. Because the Bible paper is too thin. So you'd have to tape it on a regular piece of printer paper to feed it through. Run so it through. I'd sit there all night taping Bible paper, you know, have a stack like this for the next morning to print them and then go shopping. And it was just every day was a, you know, it was like a job, you know I mean? It was yeah. constantly just a working on it. Just a lucrative. Well, I mean, you're making money. I mean, yeah. <laughs> That, that was the whole goal, you know what I mean? Like, you, I do selling drugs, doing all this stuff to make money. It's like really just cut out the middleman. That's that was my thinking, you know what I mean? If I can find a way to make legitimately good money that passed every time, there's no point in not doing that, in, in right. you know, in my eyes. But uh, so this one guy went home and he was standing in my driveway. I was gonna say, the, the people you were clipping too are drug dealers, so yeah. even if they get caught with the money. Who, you know, it's not like it's not like it's fucking a little old lady or anything, you know. And and most drug dealers think that counterfeit. Like I've had a few that found out, and I'm like, well, do you still want? Do you want to start buying them from me? And they, like, oh, I don't fuck with counterfeit. You know, that's right. serious. And I'm like, you're you're selling heroin. You're selling heroin. Yeah. Well, you know, I got doesn't... I got a year in the feds for counterfeit and hundreds yeah. of thousands of dollars. You're you're trafficking heroin interstate with guns on you, and you're worried about counterfeit. Well, he's just he just hadn't got caught by the yeah, right exactly. people yet. Once you get 15 years Fuck for an yeah, armed yeah. heroin conspiracy, you know, every counterfeiter, you wish every counterfeiter I ever met in 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 uh, prison had had they were always like the second or third time, like they were getting like two years, three years, yep. you know, five years, and it's his third time he doing it, and he got like five years. It's mm-hmm. like fuck. Yeah, they say the the recidivism rate of counterfeiting is is higher than a be. heroin addict. Yeah, but listen, the, one of the highest recidivism rates is, is fraud. And that probably, mm-hmm. they're saying that probably falls within the fraud department. Yeah. Higher than uh, drug dealers. Mm-hmm. But, I believe it. So the guy, you said one time you had moved into a place and the yeah, guy. He, I, I went pulled in the driveway and he was standing in my driveway. And this is like a drug this dealer. Guy that I've been ripping off every day for two months. And so I'm thinking like, oh, fuck. Right. This is going to be a problem. You know what I mean? But I was I was buying the heroin through this this girl that was a roommate so like i'd go up to people like i was buying stuff from drug dealers every all the addicts i knew i'd be like hey get you know from your guy help me set up your drug dealer and we'll split it because that way it doesn't fall on me so in this case i was doing that with this girl but we were living together so when it fell on her i was still there so but basically i overheard him saying like i'm not mad i just want to i just want to find out where you were getting these from so I like heard that. I just walk in the house. You know, the next day I I go up to her. I'm like, give me that dude's number. So I call him and I'm like, I'm the guy you're looking for. You know what I mean? Yeah. Let's meet up and we can talk in person. So I meet up with him and <clears throat> of course, see all these drug dealers when they do find out the bills are fake, they're like, I want two million dollars worth in a yeah. week. Yeah. Okay. And they don't realize like I'm not just photocopying these. Each one you're. Cutting them out, spraying. Yeah, this is it. labor intensive. It's exactly. I mean, you're. It takes probably ten. I mean, I got it down to where I could make a hundred dollar bill in probably ten minutes. Right. But still, I mean, if you factor a million dollars worth, that's yes. going to take months of of cutting, yeah. spraying. Yeah. You know, you're paying it dry. your bills. You still have to pay your bills. You still have to. The, yeah. And in the end, how are you going to move a million dollars? Well, and that's the <laughs> other thing. Like I tried to keep everything. Under ten thousand because that's the other thing I was printing the ninety six series hundred, so I figured it'd be kind of weird to go buy, you know, four kilos of heroin with all ninety six series hundreds. You know what I mean? That right. Kind of cause suspicion. You know what I mean? Right. Well, plus there's you have to acquire the, the the you have to acquire the paper. You have to acquire. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's just it's it's just very labor intensive. Yeah, it said in my paperwork that. uh that was the issue. I mean, obviously the paper, you know what I mean? I'd, I'd make a road trip to, say, Chattanooga, hit up 
four different bookstores, Walmarts, get all the Bible paper in the whole fucking city, and it'd be enough to to make a hundred thousand dollars worth. But you know, then you have to make it, spend it. You know what I mean? So it was a constant. Like I said, it was a job. Like you'd go to one city, collect the Bible paper in a couple of days, then spend the next couple of days you know, printing and making bills and then the next couple of days shopping. So I'd go to different cities for a week at a time to, you know, pass, you know, acquire the materials, make them and then and then right. pass them. You know. So was a guy, he wanted a million. Oh, yeah. I was like, man, it doesn't work like that. I was like, you know, if you want, say, when you're going to Cleveland to re-up, I'll, you know, I'll sell you 10 grand for 2,500. You know what I mean? So he, he started doing that. Um you know, and, and he'd have his real cash in, in there, too, but he was getting a discount on his heroin because, you know, basically 10 or 15 of, of the $1,000 he was buying at a 25% rate. So Right. But eventually that, that guy specifically was the one that set me up, and <laughs> he got to... Uh, so one time he was supposed to go up to Cleveland, and I was supposed to go with him. So, like, he was going to re-up, and I was going to, you know, bust bills. I would go around shopping. Um, and I ended up getting arrested on, I think it was like a failure to appear, some little petty thing. I went to jail, like bonded out the next day. But in that time, I guess he just went to Cleveland without me. Um, so I I got out um, and one of his uh, little runner girls that was selling dope for him uh, told me, like, she said, uh, you know, he... Uh, he told me not to t tell anybody, but he, he's in jail up in Cleveland. So I was like, he told you not to tell anybody. Yeah. I'm like, that's a red flag. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, um, and that's, yeah, towards that part, we ended up renting a, a house together as well. Um, and he was selling dough. He was like the trap house with so me in the back room with ventilation fans. Right. Blowing lacquer out the windows and making money. Um. So I, I went to that house. She she informed me he's in jail up in Cleveland. He told me not to tell you. Right. <laughs> I was like, he told you know. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm getting my stuff and getting the fuck out of here then. So you know, we uh, get all the, the the printers, computers, ventilation fans, all this stuff, and go get a hotel room. Um, and you know, there's a lot of information you find out in discovery. So yeah. like at the time, I was just thinking, okay, he's probably cooperating. Right, so I, I need gotta, to be gone. I need to get out of here. Yeah. Stop talking to him. So like two days later, I'm in this hotel, and he calls me. And he's like, hey, man, I, I got that Bible paper. Let's meet up. <laughs> and I was like, no, nah, man. Now, the I'm first like, thing he should have said was, bro, I got arrested. Yeah, I, the first thing. That's the first thing you say is because, you know, yeah. you don't want people assuming that you're cooperating. Yeah, you know? and the moment you don't mention that as yeah, being yeah. a major issue. Exactly. Exactly. I'm no dummy. Yeah. You know what I mean? I've been doing this a minute. So... Basically, he's like, oh, let's meet up. I got this Bible paper. And I was like, no. I was like, I'm just going to live out of hotels for a while again. I think I think our relationship is over. <laughs> you know what I mean? And he was like, why? What do you mean? You know? And I was like, first of all, you're acting fucking sketchy, bro. Like, you got arrested. You didn't tell me. That's a, I'm like, what are you doing, bro? I'm like, even if you didn't cooperate in reality, I still don't trust you anymore. You know, we're done. So, and he, he gave me this story like, oh, uh. Yeah, I did get arrested, um, but they didn't they didn't find anything. It was because he had a stolen car. He bought a car with a title. It ended up being stolen, and I knew that. Like I told him, he was like, "I bought this two thousand, what was it, a two thousand ten Charger for five hundred bucks in an eight ball." Right. I'm like, "Bro, that's stolen. Yeah. Obviously stolen." He's like, "I've got the title. It's not. We're good." I'm like, "Whatever, bro. It's stolen. I guarantee you bought it from some junkies for five hundred bucks, bro. It's stolen." So. He was saying, oh, I, that car was stolen. He was like, you were right, man. That car was stolen. He's like, but that's that's the only reason I got arrested. So I had to use that money, to the money I was going to re-up with, to bond out. And so I couldn't re-up. So I'm, I'm back in Knoxville. Let's meet up. And I was like, no, again. I'm like, bro, it's not happening. You know what I mean? He was like, well, well, can you? He was trying to get me to get him a kilo of heroin through some other people I knew. And he knows I don't like... I mean, I dibble and dab with drugs, you know. What I mean? Yeah, but, but I wasn't. Not I'm not selling kilos on the on the phone. He's like, get me, you know, 700 grams of heroin. I'm like, on the phone. I'm like, what are you, what are you doing, bro? So, 
needless to say, I just hung up once I right. asked for that. I was like, man, you're out of your mind. Uh, and I specifically was like, the feds are listening. Right yeah. Now. So I was like, you're the drug dealer. Why are you asking me for drugs? You are the drug dealer. I'm just, I'm just some junkie, remember? So bye, <laughs> you know, hang up the phone. And uh, well, sure enough, they GPS pinged my phone to the location of where the hotel was. And just even talking to him is what led to my arrest. Nice. So, so how they, so they, what happened? How they grab you? They come and well, knock on the door real lightly and ask you to please come outside. And <laughs> well, yeah, can you, can you meet not. Can you meet us at the, can you meet us at the uh, station? Well, the, uh, at your convenience. So I was, uh, staying in a hotel room with my wife at the time and this other, other chick, Dylan, um, who was selling drugs for these Detroit people. Um, but anyway, so they, uh, I woke up and we woke up in the morning and I was going to, you know, start printing. I think I, somebody, one of the Detroit guys wanted like six grand, I think, or something. He put in like an order. So I was going to make six grand. They went shopping. Um, so that, you know, I'm in there, I start, you know, cutting paper, spraying print and all this. My wife and Dylan leave to go shopping. That's all I know about 15 minutes later, I get a knock on the door. So I look through the peephole and it's just black. Yeah. Somebody's yeah. put. So I, my first instinct was like, oh, that, you know, the Detroit people that are selling dope out of this room, somebody's probably trying to rob them or something. Because I was thinking the police would just kick down the door. Like, I didn't think they'd put, you know what I mean, put yeah. a thumb over it. So I was like, you know, go away. Nobody's here. You know what I mean? And I, I knock again. Look, you know, black thumb over the people. Look out the window, and I see just a line of Knox County sheriffs. I was like, that's it, bro. You know what I mean? So I start trying to flush flush this paper money. Um, and I didn't, at the time, I was, I was in the process of making it, so it was all one-sided. I hadn't glued it together yet. So technically, that's not illegal because you're allowed to print money as long as it's black and white. Uh, well, what is it? 50% smaller, 150% bigger, black and white, or one-sided. So you can print money all day long as long as it's one sided. So, yeah. but they but, ha- but they have the other bills. Well, they have yeah. That, yeah. The the problem was the computer because all my bills had different serial numbers. So each file on this computer that uh, could then link me to every serial number that I produced. You know what I mean? Right. Which was the evidence that it wasn't. I didn't get possession of anything, but they got a, a laptop with. Yeah, yeah. You know all the files yeah. that could link me to every every bill that I. It's fun. It's all those those little tiny things that you're thinking. Well, technically, at this and technically, bro, you don't want to go to fucking. You don't want to go to trial on technically. Oh no, definitely. Yeah, yeah. You're just you, you know, know. I wouldn't go to trial with the feds. I would. I wouldn't go to trial <laughs> with the feds if I was innocent. Yeah. Just I, I, I I I always say, look, if they came in right now, the DEA arrested me right now and said, hey, we got you selling four fucking kilos of coke, I'd be like, well, can I get a deal? <laughs> yeah, like what? Because I know you're gonna prove it. You're yeah. gonna you're gonna it, be able to it, prove it. If they can't prove it, they're gonna get right. somebody to say it. That's what I'm saying. Like, like even if I even if I've never even seen. Yeah. seen it i know that at trial you can prove this somehow you already think you that's yeah. how you got the indictment i know i'm done mm-hmm. that's just the state people don't even realize that's really where you live yeah. well the feds don't yeah the, like you said the feds don't even indict you unless they they've got it yeah you know that's why you like in my case i had state charges when so you know knock on the door i start flushing this paper money uh you know i fl- put a like probably two grand in the toilet and flush it I go to put another few thousand in the toilet, and go, but I guess they shut the water off. Yeah, they're not stupid. So they that, <laughs> see, because like when dude asked me for that, like 700 grams of heroin or whatever, they were assuming there was drug task force there. They were assuming like there's kilos of dope in this hotel room. So there was organized crime unit, drug task force, Cleveland Secret Service, Knoxville Secret Service, KPD, mm. you know, so they, they so all these bills are just in the toilet now that won't flush. <laughs> So I'm that like, doesn't well, look suspicious at all. And then they start at that point. They start kicking the door in, which you know it's like <laughs> steel reinforced doors caused the you know a fucking panic attack because it's like I was hoping they would just kick it in, get it over with, arrest me. They're sitting there, boom, 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 you know, for like five minutes. And I don't. I mean, you're in a hotel room. What the fuck do you do? You know. Yeah, there's no back door. I just sit down, light a cigarette, <laughs> wait for him to come in, and you know, obviously they throw me down, you know, all that good stuff, but. So they arrested me on state charges for the first like three, four months um, of a criminal the, criminal simulation is what the state charge was until the feds could. Simulation of what, money? Criminal simulation is the charge, yeah. That's okay. Well, it, it's basically just their generic 
I mean, you can get criminal simulation. I think it's just a, it's like a state charge that's generic for like Making, fraud, basically. Oh, okay. You know, but uh, yeah, it was. Like, I've never heard that. That's all. You never heard that? No. Listen, bro. I think every state has different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, you know, so I think the original charge was like criminal simulation over sixty thousand or something, and then you know, three months later, you go to court. The state's gonna drop your charges. Yay! Great. <laughs> I already knew, you know, knew it was coming. So, but then of course they take me across the street to the federal building, serve me an indictment. Um, I always love the guys that they actually let them out. They actually like walk yeah. out and make the, a mistake. Yeah, they they give actually, them hope. You know, yeah, let yeah. them into the lobby and they're the free for coming. like a like a good thirty <laughs> seconds. And they're yeah. like, "Hi, I'm so and so from the Marshall." I already knew. They I had a bond source, uh, bond source hearing on my charges, which uh, you know what that is like. If you're if you're gonna bond out, where the money come have, from? Yeah, you got to prove it's legitimate and all yeah. this, which I already knew. That gives that's like a sign the feds are gonna indict you because it, that basically. You can't just bond out and get out. You've got to supply proof. the money, and then they set up a court date in a week so you can prove it. So it gives the feds a week's head start to to serve you the indictment if you do try and bond out. So, But that was it. They let me out on pretrial for a little bit uh, and sentenced me to 10 months. Right. Well, you got 10 months, but you had you said the actual – that at some point the secret cert- – they came to you. They wanted to give you – more time like you yeah. initially you were supposed to get more time but the yeah the, the original uh uh guidelines was I, I think it was like 24 to 36 or something like two to three years right um and so the secret service basically came to me uh well let's go back the the dude e that set me up right once i got arrested there he they let him go as an informant right you know what i mean and then he disappeared so he was on the run because, like, it's complicated. But like the so the Cleveland Secret Service, which could have been good, could be good. That could be good for you. It's great. Yeah. yeah. Fuck him. Because now, now you got well, now you got nobody to connect me with any of this shit, and he can't get on the stand and prove it. if well, you were to they, go to they trial. They got the laptop with the. I mean, the evidence was in my possession. Yeah. Okay. But mm. it still weakens their case. Slightly. Yeah. Yeah. But also, like, um, so he. He went on the run. Like, basically, he cooperated, got me arrested, and then he disappeared. Um, and then, like, I guess, that I was incarcerated at this point. But I heard that maybe two, three months later, he was in Knoxville again, accidentally fired a gun in his apartment. The The KPD went in there. Accidentally. I always yeah, love accidentally. the fucking idiot, man. The KPD arrested him after all, all this. He... Wanted to be an informant for KPD, Knoxville Police Department. So, he's of course, a prof- he's a professional now. Yeah, prof- yeah apparently. Um, you know, so KPD is excited, obviously, as I'm like a multi kilo dealer willing to cooperate. So, they let him go again. Of course, he goes on the run again. You know, he just makes promises to the police, and tries to disappear, which I don't blame him, you know, whatever. Yeah. But so he was on the run. So, when the Secret Service came to me, they were like, listen, this guy that set you up, your co defendant, uh, he was a co conspirator on my case. Um, they were like, he's on the run now. We're trying to get him. So when he cooperated, the Cleveland Secret Service promised, you know, you get us this guy. We won't press charges on you for the counterfeit. He does that, but then he he takes them to Knoxville. So then the Eastern District of Tennessee just indicted him. So it was just like he got a deal from the Cleveland Secret yeah. Service, but then the Knoxville Secret Service, you know. So anyway, they he was a co, uh, co-defendant on my case. Um, and... You know, the Secret Service basically said, you know, we'll give you cooperation credit if you show us how you made these bills, you know, right. and confirm everything he already told us. Make a training video for the Secret Service for future agents, you know, explain, go through all the evidence and show them. Yeah, they, they have to be experts on on bills. So to, to best the best way to be an expert is figure out exactly how these bills are being made yeah, so that course. you can detect them and see. So. I mean, and they need that. And like, they wanted, you know, to know certain things to look out for and this and that. So, I mean, this, the Secret Service said that the bills I was making were the best they've seen in like 25 years. Nice. So they, um, you know, said make a training video for future agents and we'll give you a cooperation credit. So that uh, that along with, uh, you know, like admitting guilty. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, timely, it, uh, a timely, a timely, uh, yeah, timely like admitting plea, fault or whatever it is. Timely plea and uh, acceptance of responsibility. Yeah. So th- they basically said, if you plead guilty today, we'll keep uh, 
you know, plead guilty today and make this training video, confirm everything he told us already, you know, plead guilty. We'll keep the amount under $100,000, which avoids an enhancement because anything over 100000 is an enhancement. So they, like, it was like 96000 whatever. They kept it just under $100,000. Um, and uh, we, they wouldn't charge my wife with anything. So all her charges would be dropped. And, you know, with I knew with looking at like two to three years with the cooperation and that enhancement gone, I'd only be looking at like a year. So, of course, I fucking took yeah. that. You know what I, mean? I think they said at that time they were like, we found uh, $380,000 in Knoxville. You were still finding about ten grand a week. It's coming in through the banks and right. this and that. So, you know, with that time, I don't know how much time I would have been looking at. It probably would have been four years because that's yeah. another enhancement and all this. Yeah, but that's four years if you plead guilty. Like if I know guys, if you go to if you go to trial, they'll start stacking the charges. Oh yeah, 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 for yeah. sure. So I mean, yeah, that was an offer I could not refuse. Yeah, you know, don't charge my wife. Keep it at a hundred thousand. Now I owe a hundred thousand or ninety six thousand in restitution. But you know. <laughs> it is what it is. It is yeah. what it is. So, all right. Uh, and now you're now, uh, now you're out. Three start, years starting fed, over. Fed paper. Yeah, I just got out. Uh, I was in Lexington. Um, got out like three months ago. Currently in a sober living house <laughs> in what, Knoxville. What are you doing for work now? Uh, well, I'm a printer. I'm nice. Working at a print shop, a vinyl shop. You know. Uh, it's called Graphical Warehouse. You know they're they're good people there. I'm, I really got lucky landing that job. I was honest with them. Up, you know, yeah. in the interview, I told them like I just got out of prison. I was counterfeiting. Yeah, well, it, counter that's a plus for them. <laughs> well, it's experience. Yeah, yeah. You know? Um, I was gonna say uh, I I uh, wrote a book uh, called Bent about a guy that's uh, he was a uh, counterfeiting plastic for the Russian mob. Uh, yeah. And same thing. He, all his stuff was graphic designs. He was always mm-hmm. doing. He's always worked for print shops, and you know, it's yeah. just that's just what you like doing. You know, I mean, I think like, it's tempting for people who work. You know, when you're around printers and you know graphic design, there's so many things you know. Like, yeah. with, if you're capable of fraudulently making, you know, birth certificates, money, yeah. anything, your mind's gonna jump. I to mean, that. yeah, it's I could tempting. use this for this. I could use this for this. For I could, sure, you know, for sure. And the amount of money you can make is unlimited. You know, unlimited really if you, if you do it right. So it's, it's yeah, definitely it's, tempting. It's, it's too good out here. Uh, you know what I'm saying? You go, yeah. you go to prison for a year or two, <laughs> and you're like, you're just like, you know, I'm fucking, I'm, what, am I, what am I doing? Like, I'm, yeah. I'm not going to live like this the rest of my life. I, I'd rather live in a fucking somebody's spare room and yeah, for be sure. able to turn the channel when I want and have a fucking cell phone. And, yeah. you know, when that, I was doing that, that was the most stressful time of my life. Obviously, I think that, I mean, I'm making U turns everywhere thinking I'm being followed. You know what I mean? I knew to see there were bolos out. There's a couple like pictures that were released on Knoxville websites, like, well, we're looking for this guy for passing a hundred dollar bill. You know, you're always on, on the run, thinking you're wanted, you know. You're living out of hotel rooms. Or yeah. Fuck dealing that. with fucking scumbag drug dealers all the time. Right. Yeah. You know? And in the end, when you walk back out of prison years later, where's all that money? Yeah. Like you don't have any of that money. Yeah. Like it's it's not it, yeah. it's it, I mean, in my opinion, <laughs> even what I was doing, it's just it's just not fucking worth yeah. it. I'm just plus you owe it all back to them yeah. on top of that. Yeah. So and they'll really, they strip everything from yeah, you anyway. For sure. Now you start off and yeah, yeah, it's bullshit. It, it's not the way to go. But um all right. I appreciate you watching the videos. See ya.